We are jumping into Lipany. We will have Rus available on both sides, but we will also have English in the hands of VH most likely, and Puppy Paw with his trademark Abbasids. Yeah, I think with... Oh, here we go. Now we're getting it started. Before some of the introductions, this is the grand finals of Africa TV duos spawning in on the warm colors. You have Puppy Pop playing as the Abbasid Dynasty on the western side, spawning to his north is Lash, playing as the Roos, and those cold colors spawning in the south side, both VH as the English and beastie as the roost so litacor now that this game is first started i have a question for you because a lot of the times on lipany we see roost and abbasid so what are some of the advantages that feh can have playing as the english uh instead of something like an abbasid well i feel like a lot will depend on how he's going to open this game we have seen some aggressive english builds in this tournament we have seen a lot of use for the dark age men at arms We've even seen some uh, kings being utilized in Feudal Age. I don't think that's going to be the case over here. I think we will just see a relatively slow-paced English build-up. I would not be shocked to see a second DC build. Beastie is playing the Roost and he loves the Professional Scouts build. I could see that being a thing. With the English, could be some level of poking around with longbows. But I feel like given how boomy and how defensive this map is usually played... I have a gut feeling that it's either gonna be a fast castle from VH into the Counts or into the King's Palace for a second TC, or probably a second TC build from him. I'd be somewhat surprised if we just saw the standard Knights plus Longbows combination. Yeah, I think I would agree with you as well. I mean, there is a potential for an aggression factor, right? Having some Longbow, and maybe you can disrupt what puppy paw is trying to do as the abbasid dynasty making town centers obviously is something that i would imagine he would want to do all of these civilizations have the potential to make a lot of town centers so absolutely right we can see how that kind of develops but we do have two roost players on this map and you do see some bounties coming out for both of these players both last and beastie having three scouts and Lash will be able to get to a high enough bounty at about 285, 295 after he kills that deer, going up with Wheelbarrow for both of these guys. Puppy Paw, though, making a change from his past in terms of military wing going into field lanes instead of economic wing on the last time, Litacore. What do you think about that choice? I can say the same thing about the military wing as I said in the semifinals that we've caused. I feel like it comes down to how effectively can you use those initial two spears and the two archers. If you don't get any value for them, it's going to be an underwhelming choice. And I feel like against these civilizations, I just do not see those two archers and the two spears being very useful. You're up against the English. There will be a couple of longbows to push you away. I feel like I'm not necessarily against the military wing choice over here. But I feel like it can accomplish way less than what it could do against some other civilizations. Yeah, I could definitely see that happening. The military wing just giving those two spears and two archers. It just means when that council hall does get completed, and it will get completed before that military wing, it means he might be able to get some longbowmen out and disrupt the area. The other player that that military wing would be going up against is the Roos that's putting a Kremlin quite quite forward you could see it and lashes kremlin as well i would have to say in terms of kremlin spots i love lashes look at how many deer are out there that's a lovely spot and don't forget we've talked about this one we have seen it in the semi-finals as well beast loves his pro scouts builds so not only are you securing the hunt for yourself you also possibly prevent Beastie from stealing all those carcasses from you. Yeah, that's a lot of things that Roos like to do. We've seen Pro Scouts off of some of those, so maybe it will prevent the potential of getting yoinked later in the game. But Beastie, I think instead of that second town center, we took a look at his base just a little bit ago, is going to go with a stable, already has... A knight in queue. We're seeing that military wing trying to quote unquote pay off. And what's really nice from Puppy Paw, he finds that one longbowman 
that might end up going down just because of the mobility of the Longbowman itself. And it does. Getting some of those early picks, making sure those Longbowmen don't get too masked up. To be honest, I feel like this, this military wing from Puppy Paw is paying off a little bit because it's keeping those Longbowmen back home. That's a fair point. It is definitely something that limits the movement of those initial longbows. But at the end of the day, I think a lot comes down to how you escalate from this. I think, as I said, I would be somewhat surprised if VH just played one TC longbows here. That feels a little too old school to me. It feels a little lackluster to me. Although Beast is playing double stable, so we will see a lot of knights. But I think if you play into longbows here, you need something else. Maybe a second TC into longbows. But it looks like we have none of that. I don't know how I feel about this. This could backfire pretty quickly. Beastie and Fiage will play aggressive here. They might be able to finish the game in the next five minutes and just steamroll a team that's focusing very heavily on the eco. Or they might not be able to do enough damage and then Puppy Paw and Lash will just outboom them and snowball the game in 15 minutes. Yeah, these next five minutes, I agree, are going to be super... Pivotal. I see a blueprint for an outpost for FEH, so it looks like he's going to try to get that network of castles upgrade as quickly as possible, and we're sending a villager up to do that. The issue is this secondary town center, really good synergy by both the Roos and the Abbasid, and the reason why that Kremlin is right there, second town center, ends up going up, and a lot of the resources that Puppy Paw wants to collect are a little bit behind that town center. He's shielded from Longbowman for the time being. Yeah, the key thing is that you secure the Lumberjacks with that. As the knight moves in, it will take down the villager building the tower. Looks like the villager actually gets away with just a tiny bit of HP. I think Lash could have committed against it, but he did not want to sacrifice one of the two knights that he had. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when you're talking about knight civilizations, preserving your knights is obviously going to be the best idea now. VH with that first outpost getting denied, as you said. The second outpost that he's building is a little bit safer. And Beastie trying to create some sort of turmoil in the back of Lash's base. Because he uses that Kremlin a little bit forward to try to help Puppy Paw, it means his base himself might be susceptible for some raids. So good play by Beastie trying to get around that northern side and he does have one or two knights that are congregating with the longbowman longbowman trying to find some villagers but man there is just nothing there litacor indeed not much is available right now for either side to be picked and at this point you, you look at this position and as i said if beastie and vh cannot do enough damage over here the eco of puppy paw and lash will just steamroll them now for vh it's going to be critical how he uses that scout. He needs line of sight on the villagers so that the Longbows can fire from the other side of the wood line. And that's exactly what he's working towards. And for Beastie, he is going to detach some of his knights. will try to harass some of the Barry villagers. Might actually find some success against them. Yeah, it looks like the back of his base looks to be in the most raidable area. Really good job by... VH and BC to kind of be trying to raid at the same exact point. You see up north, a couple villagers end up going down for Puppy Paw. So some of that early second town center usage ends up becoming null and void because of the amount of villagers that end up going down. But VH also had his longbowman trying to pick off some of those lumberjacks that you alluded to kind of at the same time, which is something in a 2v2 situation that seems really, really important. If you're able to raid the same person with two different people, it's like they're playing with, they have to play with double the APM. And Lash is going to be trying to get those longbowmen just out of harm's way from Puppy Paw, trying to get those longbowmen to back up. And it looks like it did a little bit successfully. I'm not seeing a lot of aggression. You're talking about what the main point is in these first couple minutes of the game as far as any kind of aggression coming out from Beastie and Fiage, and it's just, it, they're coming up dry. Good news is that they are keeping the villager count of the opponents in check. They are the ones escalating when it comes to the army department. They almost have double the army. They are harassing Vils, and they are only down by three villagers. I think they are doing a good enough job over here. This map was all about booming for a long time. Beastie and VH come in here and say, look, we can just play very aggressive and punish a team that isn't really focusing on army production. 
And so far, they've kind of been doing that. It's not perfect. They probably would have loved to see a little bit more on the villager killing department. But for two players that are playing against an Abbasid plus Rus opponent, Abbasid on two TCs, it's a pretty satisfactory position to be only down by seven vills. Yeah, and I think it prevented Puppypaw from going as greedy as he did in the last series. We saw Puppypaw go with economic wing in a lot of town centers. Now with military wing, he doesn't have the ability to do that. That second town center had to be shielded by the Kremlin as well. Beastie also using some militia, which obviously is a fantastic strategy. If you're a Roost player, you got to be using those militia. And it just creates that little bit of idle time for 40 food for two of those little militia creating idle time for nine villagers for a significant amount of time, it's a real big payoff. It's also the line of sight element again. He sent those to the Lumberjacks, or I guess the former wood line that's currently not being utilized. If there were any villagers there, the longbows would have been able to just shower them with arrows from the other side. So there, there was a lot more damage potential in those militias than what would be apparent if you just look at the unit itself. Yeah, absolutely. That line of sight is actually uh, something that I had an oversight to, pun very much intended. Now, VH will be getting some siege engineering, going to be able to get some battering rams and going with a duo of battering rams instead of just one. You can tell what building has a bullseye on it just because of that outpost being there, that front base being there, that secondary town center looks like it is in immediate danger because of some of these rams lash trying to pick off reinforcements over here on the south side bc has to pull his knights a little bit far back they're not with the longbowman over there on the western side so now it's just longbowman and a couple rams the great thing is those knights just kind of playing hokey pokey there in the back means that second town center might be right for the taking but lash going to be able to get there in time it's just the mobility of those knights he's able to get there in time maybe get those rams to do a little bit of a dance mode for them they might get a couple hits on that town center and then have to back up but it seems like because of the longbowman because of the fact that beastie called the militia they got to back up this town center is going down yeah it's difficult for those purple knights to access all these rams in this choke point and you see now lash is trying to commit he's trying to keep that dc alive Rams still out there though, and it looks like the TC indeed goes down. Counterattack though might actually work well over here as the militias were also brought in by Lash, and the Rams will be caught in the crossfire. Beastie and Fiage will be repelled over here, but they did manage to take down the down center. Yeah, I mean, they're not necessarily going to win the game by this feudal push, but definitely stop the bleeding when it comes to economic count. I mean, right now they're kind of down by 12, but at least it's not going to get much worse. Great call by Lash pulling those militia out. They do have that little bit of bonus to those knights. You see some of Beastie Knights going down because of it. Got to make sure you're not getting too overextended here. Lash a little bit decreased in the knight count. You can see on both sides of your screen, it's 11 knights to six in favor of Beastie. And Lash only has about three or four, so it's just enough for them to back up. If I'm VH and Beastie, you did a good job trying to take that second town center. What do you think? Do you keep pushing and get aggressive? You have to. A feudal age knights and longbow push is not something that you can just stop with. You know that Puppy Paw and Lash has the eco advantage. You gotta press on. And I love how Beastie is facilitating this by going heavy on the outlying resources. These little pocket ecos. He has secured the hunt before. Now he's going for the boar. And there might even be an overchop over here. He's actually bringing a whale to chop through as well. I think there is an opening already. But even if there isn't, there will soon be one. Yeah, these are the kind of cheeky plays that I wanted to see in this series. And we're only in game one. Puppy Pod, there was a chop through there, Litacore. You were correct. But Beastie with that villager doesn't really need the chop he ends up getting out of harm's way lash gonna be able to help out just a little bit he uses his own early knights in this department but just because a lot of those knights are there trying to protect puffy paws villagers it means they're not over on the south side 
And if there is some kind of battle, Lash is going to have to pull his knights back there if he wants to succeed and if he wants to stop this push from happening. The really great thing is that Kremlin over there on the south side making sure that it doesn't go any further. And look at what VH is doing. He's actually moving his entire Longbowman mass where not very a mobile army. You know, it's going to take a while for them to actually go, but it's going to wrap around all the way to the area because they know where that danger is. And as soon as I say that, Lidicor, they do the exact opposite and turn around. <laughs> yeah. Towers are getting cleaned up over here, so no more attack aura for Fiege. And this Archer Mass is building up for Puppy Paw as well, but he is not being supported by Knights right now. And Beastie and Fiege will see this. They will dive. There is still the Kremlin, though, to defend with and Malicious have been called upon by Lash. They will stand, they will hold this, and they still do have a minor eco lead, but that is where the King's Palace comes into play for Fiege, and this is going to be the first time where Fiege and Beastie will start building up an eco lead compared to their opponents. Yeah, that King's Palace is going to be really influential in the context of this game going forward. Puppy Paw also playing suit and going the Castle Age route and will be going Economic Wing. Beastie doing a good job finding raids in multiple areas, but it looks like he's not going to get much in the way of villagers. And we see this a lot, Lidicor, while these guys are going up to Castle Age, where the Night Sivs are okay in Feudal just because of how good they are in Feudal Age. Those Knights can still hold their own even though they're an age behind. They for sure can. It's, it's a premium unit in Feudal Age, but you also have to be very cautious. You cannot fight against Castle Age armies. Once there are crossbows, once there are some camel riders possibly, you do have to find a way up to Castle Age. Otherwise, your Feudal Age Knights will disappear in an instant. And needless to say is the fact that when you're playing as the Knight Civilization, you cannot afford to lose that Knight Mass. Currently, it's 30 Knights for Beastie, 22 for Lash. So once again, Beastie has the lead in that department. But Puppy Paw is getting up to Castle Age. He is going to have Composite Bows available to him since he aged up the Feudal Age with the Military Wing. And he's got 86 Archers. That is something that could be a game changer. In Feudal, those Longbows from the English were so much better. But now that we are getting to Castle Age, now that we're unlocking composite bows, Abbasid archers will become a factor. Yeah, that's a really good call on the composite bows, especially by the fact that, like you stated, have 86 archers. Puppy Paw is not slowing down in the archer department either. There's a lot in queue, and I think now with Beastie and VH noticing that Puppy Paw is in Castle Age, the veteran longbow upgrade is in. It looks like they're gonna be trying to do some damage. That fortified palisade wall on the eastern side does go down, and it looks like they really wanna take this battle, even around wooden fortresses and the like. They might be able to take a couple villagers down, but they're definitely gonna do a good job against Lash's knights. The front line of these guys are just comprised of just knights. The difference, Puppy Paw, you saw rocks flying from what looked like a different area code. Puppy Paw does have the siege superiority with the Mangonel. If they can get some hits on those longbowmen, that could be a pivotal point in this game one. And it's going to make them back up while Beastie, he's not even using the entire night mass that he has in there just because of having those extra. There's a reason why having those extra knights are good, not necessarily in the main battle, but he's getting a lot of villager kills, Lidicor. Don't look now, but Beastie and VH in the economic count are up by 20 and it's going to keep going up. Beastie has been so effective with these raids and it's starting to show. In the main battle, they are being pushed back right now. They are facing 100 archers plus some mangonel fire. But Beastie just wants to buy time to get to Castle Age. He still has 24 knights as opposed to just 8 from Lash. And once he gets to Castle Age, those guys will stomp on the battlefield. And they will be useful for raiding as well, like they are right now. Poppy Paw is bleeding so many villagers to these raids now. Yeah, this is so massive. This wood line is completely undefended too. It looks like he, Puppy Pot trying to get some crossbowmen in also, which will do some damage to those knights. But not only just the worker kills that he had, it was the idle time. Trying to find a safe wood line. You need things like if you're going to have siege superiority, you're going to need a lot of wood in order to do that. And it looks like it's been very difficult for Puppy Pot in order to do that. While on the eastern front, it looks like 
Puppy Pond last year just trying to use their entire military advantage just to create that death ball. And you see how much death they're able to create with those archers. You swear with those composite bows, it's like they're not even slowing down. They're just finding arrows into their pockets and shooting them. We are getting to the stage where Puppy and Lash just needs to use this death ball to finish the game because economically, they have pretty much collapsed. Maybe that's an overstatement, but compared to Beastie's team, now they are quite a bit down on the eco department. So for Beastie and VH to counter this, what they need are mangonels. They're facing 100 archers, only 15 knights to support them with. If you can hold this push, you'll likely win the game, but boy oh boy will you need mangonels to deal with the 100 archers. Oh my god, yeah, and there's only one side that actually has mangonels, and it's Puppy Paw and Lash's side, just with that one mangonel. Hopefully those knights from Beastie end up turning in the opposite direction, and they do now military count, like you stated, overwhelmingly in favor of Puppy Paw and Lash, and they're trying to use it to their advantage. It looks like they're going towards the English side, toward the English base. There's a siege workshop right in front, and having Puppy Paw stand his archers in that particular area, it just means that if a mangonel does pop out, they would be able to take down, but it's just a spring old beastie trying to flank over here on the north side, trying to take down that mangonel. Does successfully. Another mangonel is going to be able to get hits on that long bowman mass. A lot of them at about half health. Lash does not have the knights to create a front line. And with how many long bowmen are here, look at how quickly they are getting picked off. Even though Puppy Paw does have a couple crossbowmen in this mass. The front line from Lash, it just wasn't there. It's making Puppy have to back up. It's the network of Castle's bonus as well. Those longbows have been buffed, and that compensates for the lower numbers that VH had. Now, defensive Castle was attempted on the left side by Puppy Paw, but that is something that may not even go up if the crossbow and longbow push continues. As you said, the lack of front line from Lash is something that's haunting their team. And he's still in Feudal Age. Now Beastie's up to Castle. They are up by 40 eco. He has the high trade house as well for the passive gold income. He's working towards the relics. And we're getting to the stage where Beastie and VH will have a much more effective army as well. Not just when it comes to the numbers, but also when it comes to the quality. Yeah, and this is the point that's really difficult for Lash too, is... It kind of feels like if he does stop making knights and he stops the production, it feels like they're going to lose because if there's no front line there, that could be a major, major issue. But he's got to get up to castle. He's got to make a decision either one way or another to continue with knights or to go up with his own castle age landmark. And he does with the high trade house and a very good high trade house uh, placement, I would say, somewhere in the middle where those two little wood fortresses are. Not necessarily, it probably will be actually a little bit better than beasties but now with this fight right next to a keep that VH is trying to get up puppy paw feels like he might be able to take this fight beastie actually made an army composition change instead of going into knights goes with horsemen as long as he has some sort of front line over here he's going to be able to do a lot of damage this archer mass from puppy paw is continuing to try to hold the line the defensive and the distraction technique from VH and Beastie proves to be successful. Even though a lot of horsemen and knights ended up going down, that keep goes up. And for the English, that is all that matters. Absolutely, especially when you look at the other side. Damage has been done on the eco. Lash finally gets to Castle Age, but they do so from a position of weakness. Beastie even yoinked the relics from the other side of the map. And now we are looking at the much larger army for Beastie's team. And they also do have the eco lead. And don't forget, VH is up to 73 longbows, and now he's going up to Imperial with the Barkshire Palace. They're just confining the opponents into their bases, and if this Barkshire Palace goes up, I just do not see Puppy and Lash being able to deal with it. No, absolutely not, and the Berkshire Palace placement is pretty fantastic as well. Not only does it stop the deer from getting collected from the high trade house, but it's right by a lot of those wood lines that are there. Beastie and VH doing the correct play also of pulling all of their military prowess, all of their military mass all up here just to make sure that Berkshire gets completed. But there are no areas of problem for BC and VH trying to get that up where to the point where they're actually getting offensive and pushing the initiative. 
Beastie trying to get there with his horsemen and his knights gets through that wall that is disastrous. If we take a look up north, there's a lot of villagers up there where that deer pack is. That's going to be a lot of dead villagers. There's dead villagers to the south on that high trade house. That high trade house is officially null and void, even though it's a really good spot. Oh my god, Lidacor, it's a massacre. There are too many Muscovite peasants just hitting the ground. And now the Barkshire Palace can even range that high trade house. Eco is just being devastated now. VH is an Imperial Age. He can start going for the super powerful battering rams in Imperial. He can get some bombards going. He will have the elite longbows in the wallet deck. So many things unlocked for the English over here. And it looks like now they're committing even before the upgrades finish. Looks like the cavalry here from Beastie got cleaned up, but we're getting to the point where Fiege alone with this mass of longbows and the deck advantage he has could win the game here on this flank. Yeah, you're exactly right. He might be able to win it by himself, and especially with the Berkshire Palace behind him creating a little bit of help, it means that Lash and Puffy Paw, they can't go that much farther outside of the base. You see, as soon as they do, the Berkshire Palace isn't even on screen, and it's starting to fire arrows in this area. It's trying to take down the high trade house one fiery arrow at a time, and it looks like even with... VH being in Imperial and having the farm economy that he has. Look at that tribute. 1,000 food sent to Beastie. And what does that mean? Beastie can go to Imperial Age almost immediately. And we have a Spaskaya Tower sighting, Lidacore. I'm, I'm right now very mad that VH didn't age up with the White Tower because then we would have seen basically all the keep style landmarks available for these civilizations here. We have the Berkshire Palace, we have this Paskaya Tower. The only thing that we're missing is the White Tower. But yeah, that's going to be such a strong point again. And it's going to be extremely difficult for Poppy's team to break out of this stranglehold. They are facing some of the most powerful key landmarks. You see the Berkshire Palace firing these arrows over a long distance. And now you have this Paskaya Tower, which actually is one of the highest HP landmarks in the game. It does have 10,000 HP by default. Yeah, 10 thousand hp and does come with all of those weapon emplacements that you see you saw a spring old bolt you see cannons firing it's got everything that tower and it also has a nice little landscape nice little courtyard outside that spaskai tower how about that beastie now with imperial age going to be able to get those elite knight upgrades and probably stick in that knight department because of how good his economy is puppy paw and lash are trying to counteract some of the economic deficits that they have and puppy paw with imperial is actually going up with trade wing it begs the question litacor if they even get a trade route situated is it even safe i, I feel like that's a long-term question right now this is more about just aging up with something mangonel could actually get a good angle here from the hilltop there's no line of sight for fiage he could get surprised over here Oh no, those mangonels, they're going to be pursed atop the cliff. Let's see if they actually unpack. They do get shots off. FEH is none the wiser. Look at those hits. So many longbowmen end up going down. That's about 10 to 15 just turned into fertilizer for that wood patch over there to the northeast. That is a big amount of military that ends up going down. And just because of that little perch that's right atop, I think Beastie and FEH have to start thinking about a different area to raid. Oh, man. Still, when you look at the situation in this game, you have two players in Imperial. Both of them have pretty much all the upgrades they need. Now they are creeping up with siege weapons. And Puppy Boy is actually adding trade over here to compensate for the eco deficit. But right now, his team only has one player with a meaningful army. Lash is still recovering from all the wounds that he has sustained. He has lost access to the high trade house. He has lost access to a lot of resources. And it will take a long time for him to get back to meaningful night numbers. And it will take a long time for him to get to Imperial Age even. Yeah, I mean, we're kind of stuck with the age old problem with Lash in Feudal Age as well. He's going to have to stop some of the night production. He's going to have to stop some of the front line that he's able to to do and looking at the night counts that you can see on either side of your screen beastie with about 35 whereas puppy paw and lash's team have seven so there's a lot of range mass from puppy paw and he's imperial age which is all well and good but if they do take a fight it's going to end up being a 2v1 because lash's military count is six 
and a battle is really what they're looking for. Knights are pulling their torches out. They're going to try to take down one of those outposts. Range mass from Puppy Paw up on the north, trying to get shots in. A culverin pops out of the sheet, the siege workshop, and just as it was born, it ends up losing its life. That's a lot of resources that end up going the way of kindling and firewood. Now that range mass on that north side, a couple mangonels behind it as well, trying to get some good shots on the long bowman. Good way of micro from FEH. And to be honest, from somebody who is a developer, does a very good job of micro, making sure his long bowmen stay alive. Those elite knights from the Roost, from BC, they do have their nice little axes. You can see that season five change very well. They do have that little bit of increased attack, and it means that they can find villagers and take them down so quickly. Litacord, the economy for Puppy Paw and Lash is starting to absolutely fall apart. It's just a death by a thousand cuts at this point. For a long time, Beastie and VH had the momentum, and now they are starting to close out this game. They are both in Imperial, and every once in a while, they manage to find opportunities to pick off villagers, and it's starting to show. Now the Knights are charging in. Archer numbers dropping heavily over here for Poppy Paw. He will tap out, and so will Lash. In the grand finals of the Africa duos, it is Beastie and VH who take game number one. Ooh, what an amazing first game to really set the tone of what this best of seven really has to offer and i think i mean if we're gonna dive into a little bit of post-game analysis it just felt like as we got to the ending stages of that game it felt like lash was just kind of left behind you know he didn't get the imperial age invitation and he just stayed in castleford long enough just because he kept getting raided And with that, we do have game one in the books. We will be heading to the first home map selection of Puppy Paw and Lash. Will be interesting to see whether they choose one of their own home maps or whether they feel more confident playing on one of the home maps selected by their opponents. It looks like they're going to go with one of their own home maps. They are going to be playing on Baltic, and we have a mirror it looks like a ruse an hre mirror arguably two of the top water and hybrid map civilizations okay now you might be wondering sitting here how come you have ruse available that wasn't the case so far so one of the things to consider here is that we only have 10 civilizations in the game which means that if we play a best of seven, we will run out of civilizations by game number six. So the rule for the best of seven is that each civilization is available twice, but you cannot pick the same civilization in the same game. So you cannot have double roost, you cannot have double abbasids in a game, but what you can do is pick roost twice, and that's exactly what we are seeing over here. That's how we ended up with roost being utilized here and in the previous game as well. Yeah, and I mean, honestly, I know I'm a biased person, but uh, the more Roost, the better, to be honest. I love seeing them not only on hybrid maps show their prowess with the wood economy that they're able to do, but on land maps like on Lipany that we just saw, and we just saw Beastie put on a clinic as the Roost. He's been doing so well with that civilization throughout all the semifinals and the finals but let's not slouch on hre either they can get some good wood economy going with that Ocken chapel indeed and this is going to be one of the more intriguing games to watch in this entire series you look at dry river you look at rocky canyon dry arabia lipany we have seen a lot of games in this tournament on these maps but for baltic we haven't really seen that much in fact I would be shocked if I learned about these players having practiced this map on the Season 5 meta a lot. I feel like when you look at the entire tournament, this map wasn't really played and players probably focused their attentions elsewhere. So this is one of those maps where we could see a lot of intriguing things that are associated with players not having this map practiced as much as they did on other maps. Yeah, and come to think of it, that's actually a pretty good point. From watching both of these guys stream, and usually this is what I do when I get home from work, I just watch everybody play AoE 4 because I'm too tired to play it myself. When 
I, I don't remember seeing them doing any kind of practice on Baltic, and maybe they have. I just haven't really seen it. But this is really important on this is going to be the one map that's really important when it comes to micro. We talk about in a 1v1 setting how important it is to have the micro on the water. Think about in a 2v2 setting. You just doubled the amount of variables. You doubled the amount of things that you have to worry about on your side. So we're going to see how important micro is in a naval battle, which it's just, it's so massive. You can see one of these random demo ships get hit and can just pun intended, turn the tide. <laughs> of course, <laughs> with Roos having been picked in the first two games for both teams, it means that Roos will no longer be cited in the remaining games. HRE will be taken away as well. Now, this opens up an interesting discussion. How do you distribute your remaining civilizations? You have that feeling that English and HRE could make an appearance on Mountain Clearing. Malians, a very popular pick on Cauldron. We still have double Mongols available for both teams. One Abbasid is still available for Poppy and Lash, and we know how much Poppy loves it. A lot of intrigue coming into the remaining games as we start depleting these civilizations. Yeah, and there's one particular knight civilization that has not gotten picked yet. You did talk about the Mongols with Keshiks, but there's a lot of open maps left, especially on Beastie and VH's side with Dry Arabia, Rocky Canyon, Dry River. All of those are really good maps to pull out a French. So they could have some favorable matchups going forward. That first game, even though it's just one game, it could really set the tone here for the rest of the series. All right, we just have one and a half minutes left to go here. Needless to say, this is an important game for Puppy and Lash. This is one of their own home maps. They've lost a neutral map, Lipany. If they end up losing this, Beastie and Fiege will have a 2-0 lead. And from that point on, we basically have two options for Puppy and Lash. Go for either one of those closed maps, Cauldron or Mountain Clearing, or go for one of those very open maps. Now, the issue that oftentimes exists with choosing home maps that are very similar to each other is that if you are unsuccessful on one of them, you might be unsuccessful on both. So this is one of those cases where if you fall to zero, there are two types of maps. What if you struggle on these closed maps, Cauldron and Mountain Clearing? It's going to be very difficult to close out the set like that. And do you think just because that has the potential of that happening, maybe they lose on either Cauldron or Mountain Clearing and then they need to pick a map again. Do you think because of that, they're going to pick not the other one? Do you think they're going to pick some of the BC and F and uh, Fiege's home maps? Very possible. Although bringing a match point game to the opponent's home map would be kind of suicidal. I think <laughs> if Poppy and Lash lose over here, I think that's the time for them to pick a home map from BC and Fiege. Because... Assume that they lose that too, they would at least play a match point game on their own home map. Obviously, this is very much of a far-fetched conversation. We'll have to see how this game goes. But I think this discussion just showcases how important this game could end up being for Puppy and Lash. So for them, this being a mirror matchup, them being one game down... This is a very important game coming up, folks. We're jumping into Baltic in a matter of seconds. It is going to be a mirror of the Rus and the HRE. BSD and VH have a 1-0 lead right now against Puppy and Lash. Boss champ. Any uh, moment now, folks. Here we go. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> uh, welcome, folks, to game number two here. We do have a mirror on our hands on the right side of the map. It is Puppy Paw and Lash, and to the left, it is Fiege, and Fiege actually, and Beastie. The map is the Baltic, a map that we haven't really seen so far in the rest of the Africa Duos event, not the quarterfinals, not the round of 16th. This was the whole map selection for Puppy Paw and Lash, and we will have a Roos and HRA mirror. We talked about this in the pregame, which might actually end up being cut from the YouTube video, so I guess it's important to reiterate. If Puppy and Lash end up losing this, they do get into a precarious spot, because based on the home maps that are available, based on the momentum, things will look very good for Beastie and Fiege. 
Yeah, absolutely. They would have a stranglehold on this series. And it's not just being up 2-0. It's about the maps that are actually available to them a little bit later. And maybe consequently, consequently, if you're continuing to watch on YouTube and you see game three, four, and beyond, you'll be able to see some of those map discrepancies a little bit forward. So I'm going to leave you on a cliffhanger as we get started into game two. Now, Doc's coming out for all four of these players, obviously, and a little bit of a skirmish in this deer mini game. This is a very contested, not only deer patch, but issue in general. Some people, like myself, love this mini game. You love trying to take down deer. It's nice getting a little plus 10 tokens, plus 25 tokens, like Puppy Paws doing on that wolf. Some people don't. And I'm curious, as this game is going into feudal age, uh, what's your opinion? Do you do you like playing this mini game or not so much? I hate microing because I'm bad at it, so I hate <laughs> the mini game. I was like, I am the seven layer stone walls, boom on 25 town centers type of a player. Definitely not someone that enjoys going for all the bounty out there, and I'm not even good at it. Having said that, this map, there is an amplified, or there is an amplified importance for the bounty that you collect with the Rus. Whether you collect a lot of bounty or little will dictate how many combat ships you can pop out at the beginning of Feudal Age, how many of your fishing ships can you convert into combat vessels, and that can easily be the factor that decides who wins the water and who loses on it. And it looks like one of our players over here, that is Beastie. Beastie sitting on 100 bounty only. Man, 100 is dangerously close to 80, isn't it? That bounty isn't really as high as I would like to be as a Roost player. Now, Puppy Paw isn't that far ahead, but he has a lot of tokens available to him up top. He went out and ventured to try to get some of those deer packs that weren't as easy for him to take. And you saw Puppy Paw and Beastie do a little bit of a little do -si do around one of those deer packs, which could delay that little bit of time. But Puppy Paw might be able to win this bounty battle. Going forward now, both of these Roos civilizations are going for their perspective Kremlins. And now that the Kremlin has changed for the better, obviously nobody is really going Golden Gate anymore. But because you're able to age up with a wooden fortress that gives you the wood eco, it makes them so good on water, doesn't it? It certainly does. And that can be the momentum swing. And you see why Beastie is so low on bounty. He kind of missed out on all this hunt. And you see Lash is actually taking down the wolves. Now you might say, hey, it's counterproductive when you have your teammate that could take down all those wolves. But at this point, he's just trying to prevent Beastie from accessing those. And Beastie is struggling to find these wolves. He's at 170 bounty right now. And Puppy Paw, if he takes down those three wolves to the north, he's going to be sitting at like 300. Now he's converting two combat vessels. I only see one fishing boat from Beastie being converted this is why that bounty is so, so important. It's going to govern who gets the early advantage on the water. And I think Beast isn't able to afford a second ship conversion. No, and that really is a huge issue. You can see that not only did they convert just in time as I started speaking, they're going to be starting to take hits on those fishing boats, but you can tell that they were converting because of how slow they're moving. Look at that fishing boat from Beastie and how slow it was moving. You knew that it was going to convert into something whether it be a military ship or otherwise. Now, with Puppy Paw being able to convert two of those ships, just like you alluded to, Lidicor, he is raining havoc on the fishing economy of both of these players. Noticing that just that little bit of change really is going to dictate, while VH, he's trying to go up with the Aachen Chapel right now. He does not have the ability to make military ships. Lash on the other side, also trying to get to Feudal Age himself, but Puppy Paw is definitely coming out on top in this perspective area. And there's a demo ship over here as well. He's trying to get a connection on the fishing boats. Beastie and VH have to be very careful here. Nice little teamwork between the two. They are healing up Beastie's ship with the fishing boats of VH. And this allows Puppy Paw and Lash to be repelled by Beastie and VH. But don't forget, behind this, VH has his fishing ships idled, whereas Lash or yeah, that is Lash, that is the other HRE player. Lash has had those fishing ships working the whole time. Yeah, and that shows how important doing things like a conversion is. You want to get 
a navy. You want to get a military presence out as soon as possible, and Puppy Pod did that just a little bit better than Beastie, and hopefully with VH now that he does have his fishing economy a little bit safer now, maybe he'll be able to get some food going forward because you got to remember some of the changes that have been made to the water. Now, this necessarily isn't a Season 5 change, but it has been going on for a few months where a lot of these ships still cost a little bit of food. So you need to still have some fishing boats to get some food economy to make things like uh, attack ships or sprinkled ships. So when you have just a couple of them, it's really going to help you out and really going to maintain that kind of navy going forward. Puppy Paw also continuing on land as well. One of the great things about the Kremlin, you're going to be able to divert your opponent in two different areas. They want to focus on water, but there's stuff going on on land. Kremlin militia are trying to get some pot shots on those HRE villagers of Fiage while on the water. BC's trying to take it to Puppy Paw with a couple of spring old ships, attack ships. No villagers are going to end up going down from this raid by those militia, but it just means that the HRE have a little bit more idle time in the wood department. This is a key thing in a mirror matchup like this. It might not seem like it's much, but it will come to fruition for Puppy Paw and Lash when you look at the overall resources gathered. I guess the fact that now we have a lot more bounty for Puppy Paw will just fade into insignificance, although he is going to have tier 2 and Beastie won't. But right now, the implications of that can be seen on the water. The army count is looking a lot better for Lash and Puppy, and if they can idle these fishing ships, again, it will start to snowball that will slowly start rolling down hills. Oh, absolutely. I mean, this part of Feudal Age is very, very important, trying to get some a little bit of majority presence of the Navy on water, and you got to pay a particular attention to what either rock, paper, or scissors is going to be up against what. And where it's really important, take a look at the cues from all of these players. That demo ship from Lash trying to get in and get some good shots on Springled Chips, but not quite getting there we have some spring old ships on taking down some of those bruce attack ships over there on the south end you're talking about military strength the military strength is showing in the way of puppy paw and lash they're continuing to use their navy kind of back beastie and vh up just a little bit to their respective docks before they start moving out just a little bit and while this is all happening Lidacore, we're continuing to have kremlin gremlins getting fed after midnight and creating some idle time these are some lovely fights for puppy and lash these militias are paying so much for their price they have not only managed to idle the villagers now they managed to kill quite a few and a lot of fishing ships from Fiage also got caught in the crossfire of these naval battles. We're getting to the stage where the eco of Lash compared to Fiage, so when you compare the two HRE players, you will have an advantage for Lash. Here come the militias from Beastie, however, and he could retaliate on the other side. He needs to retaliate, because with the advantage that Lash has, it possibly opens up a window to get to Castle Age, or just to double down on water and possibly win it in feudal. Yeah, and I think there's enough militia there on the northern side as they're starting to matriculate their way down south. There's enough there where it's something that you need to deal with. And it looks like they're going to go right on that wood line, taking hits on some of those villagers. Now, what's a nice is that Aachen Chapel is giving the prelate its megaphone, so all of those villagers end up getting inspired. But if you're not collecting wood because of all of those gremlins, it doesn't really matter as much. And now that the clock struck midnight on those militia, they can safely pass away knowing that they've done enough damage to a wood line. Demo is now creeping up here. Both sides are mixing those in. Needless to say, a single demo hit can turn the tide of the battle here on the water. Both sides will be very cautious microing those to the back line. Yeah, look at the kind of micro out from these guys' players. It's demo ship on demo ship. Happy 4th of July, everybody. That was five or six different demo ships just combusting and creating shipwrecks at the bottom of the sea, continuing to have Kremlin militia raids, military count for these guys, 83 to 64 in favor of Puppy Paw and Lash, and I feel like these raids are a big difference. Not only is Puppy Paw using militia, you saw a cavalry unit over there. There was a horseman creating raids while on the water, Beastie 
and VH trying to get their forces together. It looks like they're doing a good job making sure that they're sticking together and trying to take it to the other Piggerstone's docks. Lash's Navy is not near Puppy Paws very much. It looks like Beastie and VH trying to do a little bit of a 2v1. Puppy Paw coming back from the south, getting rid of that demo ship with his archers. Good display of micro in that regard. There's a demo ship over there that we don't even get to see explode. The game got called. Oh my lord. Talk about a quick game over here. In just 11 minutes, Poppy Paw and Lash will strike back. And when you look at this game, it all comes down to two things. The bounty collected by Beastie and how he fell behind in combat ships compared to his Rus counterpart. And then more importantly, what Poppy Paw could do with the militias. And even more importantly, later on the horsemen and the knights harassing Fiege's lumberjacks. You see... The damage that has been done to Fiege's eco was very difficult to overcome in a mirror matchup like this. And it does secure the game for Puppy and Lash. Critical game, as we mentioned, now in the hands of Puppy and Lash. They even out the series, and we will go into game number three on the home map of Beastie and Fiege. Yeah, you know, I was thinking about in this game too, with... VH's woodline continuing to get raided over and over again. I was thinking about things that he could do in the broad aspect. Obviously, VH, we know he's not a professional player like Beastie, but he is really able to hold his own when it comes to micro, and you could see him do that pretty well on the water. I was thinking about things like, you know, maybe you want to put an outpost down, maybe you want to put military production buildings and start making units and that kind of stuff, but it feels like when you do that, you're spending wood in an area you would rather not want to spend wood. You want it on water. So if he did to do, if he did make some of those defensive structures, I think it would have hurt him in the Navy anyway. I'm not really sure what VH could have done to try to help himself. I think a lot came down to reactions initially. When you compare the raids that Beastie has done with the militias compared to Puppy Paw's raids, one of the big differences that were apparent is that Puppy was a, or Lash was able to pull back the villagers a lot faster. B or VH stayed out there for a long time, allowed the militias to do damage, and that meant that the militias could get a couple of picks before they expired. That wasn't the case on the other side, so while Lash was also raided by the initial militias, he didn't really suffer any major casualties. And I guess the fact that VH indeed had struggled against all those militias motivated Puppy Pot to commit more to this, added a stable, popped out a couple of cavalry units, and then punished VH. Uh, by the way, I also have to collect, uh, correct you on a thing. VH is actually a high-level AoE 2 player, or, well, he used to be before he turned dev, but he is no stranger to competitive esports either. Not the level that Beastie has played on, but you see why Beastie picked him. He is a dev, that's great, but he also has a lot of high-level playing experience. Oh, absolutely, and especially in a... That I did know. I did know the AoE 2 that he did play a decent amount of. And it is, as much as we really love the game of AoE 4, you got to give it to AoE 2 and the ability to micro. Doing things like dodging arrow fire, VH being a professional AoE 2 player, he's got the micro down to a science, I bet. You mentioned that French is not a civilization that we have seen in game number 1 and 2. We will see it in game number 3. We are heading to the first home map of Beastie and Fiege, that will be Dry Arabia. And we will have the Malians and the French facing off against the French and the English. A classic civilization combo for Puppy and Lash. And we have seen how effective this can be in their hands. In the semifinals they have played, this was the civilization matchup that secured the series for them. We have seen a spectacular build from Puppy Paw, and I'm very curious to see if he's going to do the same thing here. Yeah, I'm really curious too. And, you know, this was something that we alluded to before game two when we were speculating about maps going forward. Fortunately enough for Puppy Paw and Lash, this is not a 2 0 situation where they're really scratching their heads trying to figure out what map to play on. But I will tell you, both of these French players, whoever decides to play French, they love the open area of Dry Arabia. Let me tell you, the ability to raid just each other their prospective french players going forward is going to be very very important now 
Politicore English has longbowmen. Obviously, we know how good longbowmen are. Malians have things like Ferimba Garrison, because those are the two civilizations that are different in this matchup. I don't know. It feels like maybe just because I've seen more French and English, it feels, it feels like English might pair up a little bit better. Quite possibly, but I feel like we are in for a very similar scenario than what we have seen BSD and VH play against Marine Lord and Iona. It's going to be French knights supported by archers from the Malians and the English. But once Poison Arrows hits for the Malian player, you have a unit that will be able to destroy French knights, and the English will never really get that for their longbows, or at least not to an extent that the Malians get it with Poison Arrows. And that, I think, is something that will swing it in the favor of Beastie and VH. We have also seen Beastie using the Professional Scouts or the Warrior Scouts mm -hmm. to harass the enemies first, then ferrying carcasses. I think he's going to try to do the same as well, then transition into the trade. I think if you are Puppy Paw and Lash, you need to punish in early to mid-feudal. If it goes beyond that, you will see the effects of the carcasses being ferried in by Beastie, you will see the effects of a potential early castlage and poison arrows. And beyond that point, I do not think that the French or the English match up well against what Beastie and VH has. Mm, that's a very good point. There's a lot of different nuances that the Malians can do with the professional scouts. I mean, we saw Beastie in that last game with Eliona having two different packs of professional scouts just yoinking deer all over the field. And for how good of a safe food resource, because busy he was giving it to VH, right? Trying to make sure that he was getting stable in the night production. That pun was actually not intended with the stable. But the Malians having the ability to go professional scouts with some of those warrior scouts, maybe we'll be able to see how important that is in night production. But I do know our overlay is initiating. We're ready to get in there. Indeed, in just a couple of seconds, we will be jumping into Dry Arabia. Don't forget, folks, that Countdown is a little wacky. Sometimes it's um, a little off by, let's say, 10-15 seconds, but it usually is pretty accurate for us to hear the sheep. And indeed, we are jumping into game number three over here. Welcome, folks, to the Africa Duos Grand Finals. Game number three, we have Puppy and Lash with the English and the French against VH and Beastie with the French and the Malians. The map is going to be Dry Arabia, and we do have a barracks opening from Puppy Paw. Very similar strategy to what we have seen in the semifinals. That worked to great effect, but when you look at the civilizations of Beastie and VH, they also had a very good game against Marine Lord and Iona in the semis. This composition was a winning composition in the semifinals for both of these teams. One of them will end up losing with this comp. Yeah, and I'm very curious to see which one actually does. I was really waiting for that Vanguard Men at Arms and that Barracks from Puppy Paw to come up, and he is going to make his first Men at Arms, going to hit the battlefield. We'll see if he makes a second. But taking a look at some of the spawns for VH and Beastie, you have some gold mines that are quite, quite forward, and Puppy Paw just spotted it. it looks like those men at arms whether they go to the malian side or the french side it looks like they're going to have raidable areas obviously your primary target with that men at arms will be the french player in this matchup a lot comes down to night numbers especially in early to mid feudal age so you want to shut down the opponent's gold mining the opponent's french player and just make sure that you delay their knights production as much as possible such that your own French player gets the upper hand when it comes to the initial night numbers. Yeah, and we really saw that in one of the previous games with an English going up against a French. Those Vanguard men at arms are very helpful. VH actually has to vacate this front gold mine, getting a little bit unlucky on the spawn. That one villager just trying to get as much gold as humanly possible, trying to end up getting that 200. And with a game that's only just finished its second minute and going into the third minute litacor with how quick those men at arms got there that could really be a disruption in even feudal time indeed it could be although usually players are able to gather enough gold for feudal but the bigger problem now for VH is that he isn't going to be able to pop a knight when he adds the feudal age now think about the bigger picture here if he doesn't have a knight 
it means that he's gonna have to go Horseman. But more importantly, he won't have those tanky units that can possibly dive under town centers for a brief moment, pick off a villager. And he won't have as much of a raiding potential with those early cavalry units as his opponent would have. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, for these French players, they predominantly make up the front line. You know, having those knights and having those tanky units just means you're able to withstand the knights around the other side, and then knights just end up jousting against each other and taking hits. But especially with, like you said, not being able to produce a knight first, you're making feudal French horsemen, which is never fun. If you're a French player, you never want to do that. Now, Beastie on the western side going to be going up with the Saharan trade network like we've seen before. And I feel like... And I want to hear your opinion as well. I feel like just because of the spawn he's given, he really needs that trade network just to really defend that pit mine. He most definitely does. Especially if you look back how Beastie has played this Civilization matchup in the semifinals. He has played into a semi-fast castle because he knew fully well that the best tool for Malians and French to beat French and English will be mass poison arrow archers. From the point that you get the poison arrows, you will be able to destroy the enemy knights very quickly, and the opponents won't have those tools available. They will not have a unit in Feudal Age that kills your knights quickly. So for Beastie, the game plan here is pretty straightforward. He's going to try to expedite the castle age timing here, and he wants to get the poison arrow archers to support his teammates knights with. Now the issue that he's facing is that his teammate won't have knights immediately because you see, right now, the mining camp is being denied and VH is unable to access any gold. Yeah, and it's not like he can go to his teammate's gold mine either because now that that Saharan trade network is just completed, now is when it's actually safe. So now with Puppy Paw adding in, bringing that Vanguard men at arms up in that particular area, Beastie going up with professional or in warrior scouts not professional scouts warrior scouts he might be able to do some raiding to lash on the other side we do know how hard it is for the french player when they do get raided in that early feudal age to do that now feh with two horsemen as of right now trying to go up against this scout and two vanguard men at arms and even with those horsemen the men at arms can really hold their own dark age or otherwise Indeed, they do have a lot of melee armor, and you see the horsemen are slow to clean them up. So much so that you do see a knight now moving in from Puppy Paw. He's crossing the map over here, and by the time you clean up these men at arms, the knights will arrive, and things will just get a lot worse. As you said, Beastie is playing into some warrior scouts, but compared to what has happened in the semifinals, he isn't able to use them for raiding before getting professional scouts. He needs to help out cleaning this whole thing up. But just when he's done cleaning up the men at arms, the first knight arrives. Oh, in picture perfect timing, that first knight arrived. And it's kind of, it's funny to me that Lash actually backed up a little bit. You know, I mean, he's up against some horsemen, he's up against some warrior scouts. Now he's able to get reinforced by a couple longbowmen from Puppy Paw, too. I think they're understanding where they can really attack and. BH, he really, really needs gold. He needs it so bad. He's pulling all of those villagers. There's six villagers. He was trying to pull them to the southwest, trying to get an outpost, trying to get a mining camp there. There's too much militaristic presence from Puppy Paw and Lash, so he has to go in a different direction. Not only, I mean, that gold mine, it is technically quote unquote safe because there's no long bowmen or knights there, but it's just, it's so much idle time. We're still waiting for that gold. This is such a delicate position for Lash and Puppy to be in. I don't think that with three knights and three longbows, they could have committed against four warrior scouts and four horsemen. And they didn't even want to commit. They just wanted to scare the villagers away. Kind of telling the opponents, like, look, you can send your army here, but I will die with the knights, kill your villagers, and then just go away. Now with the palings deployed, the longbows are shutting down these gold mines, and this is very good for Lash and Puppy Paw. The Longbows keep an eye out on those gold mines, and Lash knows fully well that the opponents will try to get gold from somewhere else. I expect to see those knights probing those gold mines very soon, and indeed, here comes the knight, and this is once again perfect timing for Lash. He can possibly stop this tower, and things are looking very desperate right now for Fiege. 
Oh, Lidacor, you talked about probing those gold mines. And man, you are just so good at this because that's exactly what they do up there on the northeastern side. A couple villagers will most likely end up going down. It looks like Lash's Town Center also getting in with some of the fire. Now, these knights, when they do charge, they're able to catch up to the horsemen. When they are not charging, it's going to be difficult for them. But a couple horsemen end up going down. Puppy Paw actually protecting his own longbowmen. You can see what he was doing with reinforcements. That's why VH's horsemen are up as high as they are, or I should say as south as they are, because they were trying to pick off English reinforcements. But Puppy Paw, when he had a couple archers, he brought a spearman with him to try to do that and you saw now he has a long bowman mass over here in VH's side of the base there's been a lot of idle time obviously because of the gold mine now we're starting to get villagers to actually die because they have to be moving around the map all the time now beastie trying to add in a couple javelin throwers maybe they'll be able to help against long bowmen it looks like there's just so many long bowmen here where it i don't know if it's going to matter and some spearmen as well if VH had a lot of knights, a handful of spearmen wouldn't be a big factor. But when you only have horsemen, even just a handful of spears are immensely valuable to hold back the cavalry. And you see VH, he got propelled. He's sitting on just one horseman, cut off from gold. So much so that Beastie will just tap out. In less than 20 minutes of game time, Puppy and Lash take two games in a row. And for the first time in the grand finals, they will take the lead. That is, that's definitely the quickest one that we've seen so far, both in the semifinals and the finals, even beating the Baltic timing. Because usually on water, you have that snowball effect where the water maps end up going pretty quickly. But I really think the MVP of this one were those two Vanguard Men in Arms that Puppy Pod decided to make in Dark Age. How much damage they were able to do to Fiege's French. That French player, he just he couldn't get up off the ground. That has been the recipe in French versus Mir uh, French versus English matchups for a while. Get that man at arms going and prevent the French player from going into knights. But in a one v one setting, it's difficult to punish the French player for not having knights. Not so much in a two v two setting. The knights from Lash supplemented this aggression very well, and. This is exactly how pla how Lash and Puppy Paw has imagined this game. This was the game plan from the beginning. And that man at arms, as you said, it did so much damage. Obviously, the map generation wasn't very favorable for Beastie and Fiege. But this was a story of the man at arms shutting down the gold mine. And then just the night numbers being massively in the favor of Lash as a consequence to that. Yeah, it just felt like VH especially, even even though we were in nine minutes into the game, it just felt like VH was always going to be battling uphill just because of those night numbers. And I think we didn't see a lot from Beastie and VH in terms of that Mali and French composition, so much so that they wanted to give it another shot. They're going to pick the same thing for game four on Rocky Canyon. I have mixed feelings about this. I I. I had to take a couple of moments to think over my thoughts about this. But here's the thing. You look at Malians and French. What they have done against Marine Lord and Iona is still an extremely powerful build. But you need to have night numbers initially for this. The entire build relied on the fact that Beastie isn't committing much to army. He is getting some warrior scouts. They both have mobility to raid and harass. And that map control that they secure with the knights and the warrior scouts, it turns into carcasses with professional scouts. Those carcasses turn into a castle age, and castle age turns into poison arrows. That was the mindset, that was the strategy. Now, the alarming thing here for Beastie and VH could be that as much as the English men-at-arms could shut down the French gold mining, Ottoman spearmen can accomplish the same thing as well. I think the timing is going to be insufficient, if you play military schools for Puppy and Lash, but a Dark Age barracks, Spearman Bush, or possibly even military school plus barracks could be detrimental once again to the gold mining operations of VH. Yeah, I mean, if it worked the first time in game three with men at arms, why mess with success, right? I mean, if you're going to double down, you just kind of relayed the strategy that BC and VH want to do. It's kind of like the 
path to poison arrows, essentially, in Castle Age. And it really does. It does make a lot of a, a difference. And I could definitely understand why, especially in this matchup, when you're going up against the Ottoman Empire, which will make a decent amount of ranged units. And those ranged units come in the form of not only archers, but Janissaries as well. We highlighted Janissaries in previous Ottoman games. Malians, whether it's Poison Arrows or otherwise, are going to be able to do really well against Janissaries and preserve French Royal Knights. So I agree with you. I mean, for Puppy and, and uh, Lash, it's all about just getting there. You know, making sure that you are not letting BC and VH get to that Poison Arrow, much like we saw, much like the analysis that you gave us in Game 3, where just don't let them get to that point and you'll be okay. And I think with Ottomans, even though, just like you said, it's not necessarily men-at-arms, it might be able to still do the same amount of damage. And the one thing about Spearmen, which is really great too, is if you get that same amount of damage against that French player, say VH is going for French again, I'm just speculating, I'm not sure who's going is who, but say you're able to get that same amount of damage with those Ottoman Spearmen, he makes a school of cavalry, he makes horsemen, you're going to put a horseman against a couple Ottoman spearmen, whether Dark Age or otherwise. I think it could potentially snowball to be worse. Yeah, that's that's the scary detail, right? This snowball could be just as bad as what we have seen in the previous game. So I guess that raises the question of what Beastie and VH can do to respond to this. It's a tricky choice because you don't you do not even want to commit to a tower if you're VH. We have seen that attempt in the Marine Lord series, if I'm not mistaken, dropping a tower to respond to the aggression. But that already sets the French player back a bit. And those small differences can be enough in a French versus French setup to fall behind a lot over time. So I think, as crazy as it sounds, I think the best choice might be Beastie going for a couple of Donsos at the beginning. That should secure the gold for his teammate, it would also mean that he has something to respond to some knight's harassment with, and then just continue on with the plan. It will delay Beastie's plan a little, but Beastie's play and Beastie's build is way less time-sensitive than what VH is playing with the French. Yeah, absolutely. To be honest, I didn't really think about using Donzos in the beginning, just because the Malians are so pressed on in the way the Malians have been played over the past couple seasons about getting things like your warrior scouts going as fast as possible and dropping a stable and doing all that kind of stuff. You don't necessarily think about putting a barracks down anymore for the Malians, but the Donzos, they do match up with the Spearmen. They have an extra melee armor, if I remember correctly, so they will be able to do good in a one-to-one -one combat if they're able to do that. And just like you said, they're able to have later game potential in being a good unit just because you know knights are going to be coming out as well. So... I actually, Ludicor, I think you're on to something here. I think that's a good one. I don't know if Beastie's going to do that, though. I feel like that is that is quite unlike Beastie. I'm not saying it's impossible, but usually when you look at a Beastie game, he is happy playing with limited military for a long time because he's really good at preserving what he has. Pulling away the villagers in time, having some crazy micro, jumping in and out of the TC, all those things. Dark Age Tonsos is not something that you directly associate with his playstyle. But I think in this scenario, that might be the safest choice. I don't think, or I don't necessarily know if that's the best choice, but it feels like that's the safest choice to avoid what has happened in the previous game. Yeah, I mean, I can agree with you. I mean, you can't... What's the definition of insanity, right? Doing the same thing over and over again. But hold that thought. We're getting right into the game everybody welcome to game number four africa duos grand final spawning in in those cool colors beastie playing as the molly and spawning to the north of him playing as the french is vh yet again spawning in the south as the warm colors puppy pog gonna be playing as the ottomans and lash gonna be playing as the french over there on the south side and for the people that are watching on YouTube, this is our fourth installment of trying to do this. We've had some crashes for game one, two, and three, but game number four, a little bit different, Litacore, and there's one reason why that gold from Fiage, that is tucked away in the back. Indeed. As you can see, we are also missing our lovely Observer UI. Part of the reason why is because, as you highlighted, 
we had three previous crashes, and the issue of those, or the, I guess, the underlying cause of those crashes is not something that the devs are aware about. So at this point, we can just make some guesses. Well, it's not us, but the admins. Admins had to do their best to resolve this issue, and hopefully we will have a game now without major crashes. As you mentioned, one of the key moments of the previous attempts, as well as the game number three, where we had an English player involved on the side of Lash and Puppypaw, was pressuring that gold mine and cutting off the French player from gold. This time around, VH will have a safe gold mine at the back, and I'm actually wondering if he's going to place a defensive tower on it. I think it's still wise to do it, because if the Spearmen get there in time and you don't have a tower, you will still be cut off from it. You will have enough for Feudal Age, but you still won't have enough for Knights. Yeah, and I think because of the previous renditions that VH, he's kind of instinctively putting down that outpost because he knows that there is some bad stuff that could be happening, whether it be military school, barracks, or otherwise. In the first rendition, Puppy Paw had a barracks, went for the military school this time, however, and we'll be using that Spearman. That gold is still front for Beastie, a Beastie based on where that landmark is situated by the starting town center. It looks like Mansa Quarry will be coming out for him again instead of the Saharan Trade Network. So they're going to help him out in that passive gold area. But again, we talk about because of that outpost for Fee Age Lashes, Feudal Age is probably going to be that little bit quicker getting that first night out there. We talk about night numbers with the French over and over and over again. It really turns the tides in battles and it sets the tone. Yeah, this is going to be the fourth time of me saying this, given the crashes before. But when you look at the French versus French setup, if you do anything other than making knights and working towards making more knights, you will fall behind compared to your opponent. So that tower being built over there by VH is a bit of a setback compared to his opponent Lash. Now, it's not that big of a delay. It's way better to have that tower built and your gold miner secure than you being pushed away from the gold, but it is something that sets VH back a tiny bit compared to Lash. Yeah, it does a little bit, and especially in the wood department when you want to do something like put his tech and stable down for night production. Obviously, that could be an issue now. This is one of the only renditions where VH was able to mine his gold quite peacefully, and it means that he's able to queue up a knight pretty much immediately, and it also means Taking a look at Beastie's base, which we did a little bit before, he doesn't have to go for something like an early archery range or an early barracks or something like that. He still goes with the stable, and he's going to be making a couple of warrior scouts, but also adding a mill in that particular area right next to that starting town center. Might we see some red meat harvested by the Malians? Yeah, he's moving out towards the additional gold mines as well real quickly. Obviously, it will be a bit of a challenge to clean up those spearmen when you have only warrior scouts and knights and the houses will continue to be torched down over here looks like uh we survived getting into feudal age without the crash and i guess the cool thing here to highlight is that what we see over here is pretty much the same thing that we have seen in the previous two attempts of playing this game or at least attempting to play this game so it's not like either of these team has suffered from a gigantic disadvantage compared to the previous two attempts the first attempt was very different from this but at the end of the day, we do have a game over here, and I guess that is something that we should be happy about. Houses got torched down over here, but as you highlighted, Beast is going for Warrior Scouts. He loves to play Professional Scouts. He has played this Malian plus French combo in the semifinals with the Warrior Scouts and the Professional Scouts deck, and I think he's going to do the same over here. Yeah, it did show a lot of success. Beast, he actually changing his army composition just a little bit and we saw a malian archer in that area as well villager looks like he's trying to repair that house but not going to quite get there lash is doing a tremendous job with his micro and what he's trying to do he sees the villager over there he knows they're trying to make more houses and all that those warrior scouts just basically i don't know what's made out of that sword but it's got to be something like plastic because the knight is not affected whatsoever and continuing to try to find that villager and now we're getting into the feh now that he has a good stable gold supply and he will be able to make knights on a consistent basis he's now looking to push the offensive he's looking to raid 
any particular areas, and especially Lidacore, we talked about this a couple times, you got to be raiding your French opponent, right? You absolutely have to. You want to make sure that you are the one setting the tempo. And if you are beastie, you also need those hunts to be secure and your warrior scouts to be unharass unharassed as they ferry in the carcasses. And the best way to accomplish that is having your French player raid the opponents and distracting them that way. You see, the carcasses are being bought towards the French player here. That is not unexpected. Beastie is having his own food eco based on cattle. But it looks like VH is going to move in, and he is a force to be reckoned with when it comes to these night raids. You look back at the semifinals, he has made the life of Marine Lord and Aliona a nightmare with those knights. Oh my god, he absolutely has, but he does get those knights a little bit of harm's way just because of those spearmen. What's nice is those spearmen don't necessarily have a horse, so they're going to end up getting left in the dust. Puppy Paw going with a mix of a bunch of different units. You saw in his army composition, we have some spearmen here. There's an archer over there, Sapahi over there on the south side as well. He's going with a lot of different military buildings and just trying to hold his own. Lash on the other side, being the French player and the good French player that he is, looking for raids in particular areas, really trying to eye up that back gold, which again is so, so important. But there's another resource node up to the north of that. That deer's pack over there, which has a couple of French villagers, could be very useful. Quite interesting for me that VH actually went to go get that area. There must have been a little bit of lapse in pro scouts, so he needed that food as soon as possible. But it makes those villagers, there's about four over there and about five on that gold mine, it makes them targets. Yeah, I feel like there's a bit of a disconnect between the strategies here. With the carcasses being brought into VH's base, villagers moving out to the hunt is a rather, I guess, aggressive choice. And now two knights go down here as well, villagers once again becoming targets. You gotta be cautious not to lose knights, that applies to both of the French players over here. But that's a lot of idle time forced on VH, and again, one has to wonder if that is needed, that hunting operation given the fact that Beastie is providing his teammate with food. Yeah, and now I think that he has that stable source. Maybe he'll be able to go back behind his starting town center and make sure that he is not raidable. And what's actually what Beastie's doing, as you can see on your screen, he's yoinking his teammates' deer, but not necessarily for himself. He just wants to make them safe. So he's going to pull those deer and probably pull them back to... Ages starting town center just to make sure that no other night raids kind of happen. And now with Lash, he got a little bit of initiative with those Royal Knights. A lot of the battles have been being taken in the area of VH and in the area where these warrior scouts are, where they're going to get almost surrounded by some of those knights in Sapahi. But Lash is going to be going for a second town center. Litacor, this is the first time we've seen Lash go for a second town center as the French. What do you think about the play? I have mixed feelings about this. Not because of the second TC, it's because of Beast's resources. You look at the top left, he's getting close to Castle Age. And we discussed this a lot. The potential for Puppy and Lash to stop Beastie is before Castle Age. If Beastie gets up to Castle Age, he gets archers with poison arrows, he's gonna have a tool to destroy everything that Puppy and Lash have. And you see, Beastie's very close to Castle Age over here. I don't mind the second TC from Lash. I think it's a great way to pull ahead compared to VH. But we need to see a response to those poison arrow archers from Puppy and Lash. And I think that is lacking right now. Yeah, I definitely agree with you. And we're going to see those poison archers happen very quickly. Beastie, you can take a look at the resources up on the top left part of your screen. Beastie with about 1,500 food now just has the gold and will be placing his landmark as soon as I finish this sentence. Puppy Paw also stockpiling resources a little bit by himself. Puppy Paw with 1,100 food, 450 gold. Might we see a little bit of a faster castle for the Ottoman Empire more than usual? We were expecting a lot of feudal aggression. It seems as though they kind of pulled the carpet out from under us because those previous renditions did have a lot of feudal aggression. This one, not so much. This is a big discrepancy between how Puppy Paw plays the Ottomans and how Marine Lord played the Ottomans against Beastie's team in the semifinals. Marine Lord went up to 90 archers. He had the numbers advantage, but over time, Beastie's army quality just ground him down. Here, there is going to be a big difference. Puppy Paw is going to get to Castle Age, and Ottoman archers do trade very well against those Mali and Poison Arrow archers. 
Molly and Archers are probably better as an all-purpose unit, but there's a key discrepancy here. Archers, Molly and Archers those are, they do not want to fight against a large amount of low-tier units, like the Ottoman Archers. They want to fight against the premium units, the Knights. If you add it up with the fact that the Ottomans unlock Janissaries in Castle Age, it's going to be a great tool to deal with the enemy cavalry, and you're starting to like the position of Puppy Paw and Lash more and more. Yeah, I remember you talked a lot about in our previous renditions about having the tool to get rid of the cavalry of the opposing side, and the Janissaries could have the ability to do that. We're seeing knights all over the place from our French counterparts. There's a lot of mobility. There's a reason why those knights are so good. Pound for pound, one of the best units that you can have. It looks like a couple horsemen in there from VH as well. Looking to try to get a charge. Lash does, but Beastie coming back with a little bit of reinforcements. His army composition comprised of mostly archers and some javelin throwers. But now that Beastie has the Frimba Garrison, he will be able to get a decent amount of archers and or javelin throwers, whatever he necessarily decides to make. Lash doing a great job with this micro. I mean, he knows if he takes this fight, this is a losing battle for him. He loses knights, he loses the game. One of the things he's doing really well, Lidacor, he's turning around, he's getting the charge, and then going back home. And he needs to do that. He is retreating over here, getting pushed back by both Beastie and Fiege over here. And Puppy Paw is just trying to chase down all those raiding cavalry inside their base. Something that did plague Marine Lord as well when they played the semifinals. Now the armies link up, and it looks like Fiege and Beastie will have to retreat, but that does not happen before they lose a couple of knights here. Yeah, a couple knights went down, a couple horsemen as well. You can even see those gunpowder units over there on the south. Puppy Paw doing a good job trying to get some Janissaries for total in that, and I would imagine more end up coming out. Just having a couple of them interspersed is really going to help you against the Royal Knights that the French players really, really want to do. And you can see VH having to go out pretty far to get some of those resource nodes, some outside Gaia resources. That big, large gold mine is over there on the eastern side along with a boar he did have the presence of mind to wall that area but we talk about how raidable a french player is not only with lash having that second town center that's pretty in front but vh doing the same thing exposing his villagers pretty far out there Big, big, big fight coming out on here. Lash trying to get a charge on to Fiege's Royal Knights. Looks like they'll be able to scamper away. They're trying to break off just a couple of them. A couple Janissaries come out of the woodwork, what looks like, just because of that forest patch a little bit south. We'll be able to take some pot shots on some of those knights. These knights just looking for areas to raid, and you can see how well they dictate battles, Ludicor, just because of the knights being there. It shifts the entire army of Lash. So while his north side is exposed, he's getting villager kills, he's still trying to chase these knights to the ends of the earth. It's it's the one-two punch, right? You have to pursue this army. You might even clean this up, although that would be kind of problematic for Fiege. But this is a great distraction that allows Beastie to push up alone in the middle. Normally, that's a scary thing to do when you have archers only, but he's got the poison arrow archers. If you send knights against it, Beastie can deal with it. If you send archers against it, Beastie's gonna be fine against that too. Now, looks like the Janissaries are increasing in numbers and they are repelling this. So in retrospective, losing all these knights for VH could be problematic. He did distract his opponents, but it's not like he inflicted heavy casualties. And he's losing a lot of very expensive knights over here. Although he went up on a second TC, just like uh, Lashes. So it's not like replacing those knights will be impossible. Yeah, he did go with that second town center. I agree with you. I think Lash is able to reap the benefits of that second town center just a little bit before, just because of how early he was able to get that up. He kind of had that game plan going into it in the Feudal Age, just trying to get that area. And now he's going to be able to produce knights very, very well. It looks like his macro has been pretty good as well. VH, he's been trying to find villagers. We've been tracing these knights all around the map. And I want to say... He's gotten maybe two or three. He's going to add a couple more in this particular area. Actually, he does not. No villagers end up going down, but more and more knights 
are continuing to go down. It's going to take a while for that second town center to pay off. You can see those arrows from the Malian archers. They do have that just little bit of hemlock there. It's going to be able to create some poison problems for the Royal Knights of Lash. Those nice pink Royal Knights moving up north. The problem is I think there's too many of them going to make Beastie have to back up. Not only does he have the knight superiority, he's got the siege superiority. You're talking about units like archers. They go up with those poison arrow archers. They go up well against Ottoman archers. They hold their own against knights. Big mango shot here. It looks like about five or six archers end up going down. Now that mass is reduced significantly. Those archers, they don't have an answer to a mangonel. Not just the mangonels, but also the janissaries. That's the problem. You see this composition, as we discussed so many times, Beastie's Poison Arrow Archers are good against almost everything. But they need support against Manganols, as we do have Beastie moving out for keep over here. He needs to turn back, and indeed he will. But the problem that he's facing is that he's facing Manganols, and as long as there are Janissaries for Puppy Paw, his teammate VH cannot snipe them. The Lancers cannot commit against the Manganols, because the Janissaries just make min minced meat out of them. This is the combo that Lash and Puppy needed, and this is the combo that has been missing from Marine Lord and Aliona when they play the semifinals. Those Ottoman archers are just good enough to keep the archer numbers from Beastie low, and then the Manganols, the Janissaries, and the Lancers, they do the rest. Yeah, you're exactly right. I think it's how quickly you're able to deal with the front line of your opponent having the amount of Janissaries that Puppy Paw has they do a better job one for one against some of the cavalry units like the Malian Poison Arrows Dart, but there are a lot of arrows. Manganel's trying to take shots at the cavalry units, not necessarily the archers, and a couple of them will get injured in the making of that, but it looks like just because Beastie got that keep up just in time, they're going to back up just a little bit and have a little bit of a ceasefire, maybe go back to the drawing board. If you're Beastie and VH right now, you know that you're on the back foot, you know that your composition might need to make some changes. What are you thinking about trying to change to try to figure out how to deal with this puppy paw and lash death ball? I think it starts with a defensive approach. First of all, there is Royal Institute for VH. He's going to get to Castle Age. Naturally, veterancy on the cavalry plus Royal Bloodlines could be a big factor. But I think a lot comes down to the fact that Right now, you do not see any heavy siege available for Puppy and Lash. They cannot commit against keeps. So what do you do? You play defensive, you play with stone walls, some defensive towers maybe, or keeps. That's the best option. And maybe play into the Malian trade. We have seen Beastie do that very frequently. And just try to build an eco lead first and win through the numbers game. Now it seems like Puppy and Lash will not allow, allow that. Here come the Knights, here come the Janissaries as well. I think the other thing that Beastie could do, just a quick second thought on that, is maybe Manganols themselves. A single volley of those Manganols could be detrimental to the life of those Janissaries. Yeah, and especially for how grouped up these units are right now. Obviously getting very, very upset at that Palisade wall, but they want to make sure there isn't that much of a choke point in that particular area now that Beastie has been Castle Age for a while. It takes a little bit of time for Malians to do that transition in Siege, but he does so with Springolds. The Ottoman Empire, played by Puppy Paw, does have three different Springolds that can help him out. It's all about getting those mango shots now. Fiege's Knights are of the veteran status. It looks like Lash's are as well. We're gonna see that charge come in. Lash not paying attention onto this one. It makes sure that charge on the Royal Knights for Fiege goes on the ranged mass for the Ottomans. The Springolds for Beastie do get rid of one Manganel, but it doesn't get rid of the second one. We'll continue to rain down good stagger formation out of Beastie, making sure it doesn't get too much in the way of damage. But you can see how good the Janissaries are in this particular battle. There are a lot of teal veteran knight corpses in this area to the point where Puppy Paw's ranged mass, maybe it took about 25 to 30% damage. And again, a little bit of a distraction tactic too, because they could look at that Lidicor on the Eastern side of the screen. There's an Ottoman keep right in the face of Fiege. Yeah, that's the big thing, right? You see the corner, I think trade is being set up by Beastie right now. In fact, you see a trader right now for Fiege, but so many things happen in this battle. 
One of them was Janissary is coming in clutch. We talked about them as a great support unit in a 2v2. You mix them with archers and they are just massacring enemy cavalry. But the second thing was holding back that mangonel. The same way that Papipo has done against Louis MT and Yui Metal. He held back the mangonel until the springboards were cleaned up. And after that happened, the mangonel was just so useful to push back Beastie's archers with. And you see, even without the matter buff, now Puppy is willing to take these engagements and they are pushing back the archers from Beastie. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this range of mass from Beastie looks to be cut in half at this point. Poison arrows or otherwise, even some sprinkles in the back, getting some good bolts and hitting a couple of them. There is no way this trade ends up getting definitively situated for Beastie and Fiage. They did a good job in their plan of attack as well. They really split the difference between both of them and cut that trade route in half. And now that Lash has the night count, VH doesn't necessarily have it. It means he can go raid. Look at all those French peasants. They are running for their lives, trying to get into that initial town center. VH's knights are trying to meet them in that area. You did see Puppy Paw have a couple Lancers for himself out of the Ottoman Empire, not necessarily just making ranged units, so he does have the potential to raid if he wants to. Springolds from Beastie doing a good job on the Springolds of Puppy Paw. And even though there's just a couple Springolds that go down, Springold numbers being three to two, Siege Superiority, you know, plays such an important role in this game. Another one that plays importance, Villagers. And this is the economic underbelly of VH right now. Look at all of the villagers. There's only 10 slots to put in that town center. Litacore, look at how many villagers are here. There's like 40 over here. This is just crazy damage being done over here. This area was secure for a long, long time, but it no longer is. Luckily with the knights shifted here for VH, he is going to repel this aggression, but there's a lot of idle time on him. Lost a couple of villagers. There is still a keep in front of his face right now. And you see now the focus for the Ottoman archers will be the right flank as well. Villagers will get picked off as they flee to the TC. The eco of Fiege is crumbling right now. Beastie, he needs to do a lot here to turn this around. Yeah, I mean, look at Fiege's food count right now. It was sitting below 100 for what felt like an eternity, even though I know it was probably about 45 seconds for Fiege and for myself. It certainly felt longer. That's for sure. Beastie trying to pull his ranged mass over to try to protect Fiege as we know he is in quite disarray at this point. A lot of those villagers creating a lot of idle time. That palisade wall over there on the eastern side does finally get broken. Both the Ottoman Empire and Lash's knights are trying to get some more vil kills. Keep tries to go up, ends up getting reduced to a foundation just because of the perfect timing from them. Look at all of those villagers. Oh my god, it's an entire French province. They have nowhere to go. They're running for their lives with all of their baskets of wheat. Cannot get collected. This is the entire French economy, or at least 65% of it, getting absolutely idle. This is so big for Lash and Puppy Paw. And Beastin needs to stand here to protect this one. Now it's archers buffed by the matter. They will be focusing down Beastie's archers. Emergency keep on the way here for Fiege. Keep is likely going up, but once again, he's taking heavy casualties. His eco is being shut down to a point where he isn't really able to mass produce units now. And on the other side, you do have a completely untouched eco for Lash. He has probably completed the farm transition by now, and he just continues to send in wave after wave of knights. This is the problem now for Beastie and Fiege. Fiege has taken so much of a damage that it's going to be difficult to keep up with the knight numbers that Lash has. Yeah, and you definitely hit the nail on the head with Lash's farm transition as we took a look back. Most of those farms getting completed. They've continued with the siege superiority with those mangonels that spring will getting caught out out of place and will get popped like a balloon. A lot of those French provinces, a lot of those French farms are going to end up getting completely retreated. This is just idle time after idle time. This is so much damage and probably the best amount of damage that six or seven knights can do. Even when they're not actually killing anything, it's all of that idle time. Beastie says, I've had enough. VH agrees. Lash doing the excellent job being the MVP of this game. And it's a 3-1 lead for Puppy Paw and Lash going into game five and going into match point. 
what a series they're playing. They were down one game after game number one. They have had two wins in a row in less than 25 minutes of game time. This one, a longer game, but the early second TC paid off for Lash, and then the early Castle Age from Puppypaw, getting those archers going, getting those Janissaries going, and having that combination of the meta-buffed archers and Janissaries, making life very difficult for Fiege. Beastie did have the Poison Arrow archers, but they couldn't really play as they wanted, because you did have the Manganos on the side of Puppypaw, he did have those Ottoman archers, and Beastie was just never given those favorable trades that he was given when he played the semifinals with this comp. Yeah, definitely a difference of results, not only, but also in game plan, in execution, going into that game four. I'm very, very curious about what civs we're going to see heading into game five. This being 3-1 again, Puppy Pond Lash on match point Beastie and VH on the brink of elimination. I think this is the time if you're Beastie and VH, if you have one of those two minute warning strategies, you should probably pull it out right about now. I have a wild card call here. I think. Oh, Beastie... hit me with it. I love it. <laughs> Beastie and VH, I think, might go mountain clearing. That's a map that they love to play. The thing is that if they want to turn this series around, they will have to take two wins on the opponent's home maps. At this point for them, it does not matter whether they lose 4-1 or if it's a 4-3 loss. So might as well go for Mountain Clearing, which is always a wildcard map, and it's a map that they also feel confident on. And that, if they win it, assuming that they win it, that would be a 3-2 standing for Puppy and Lash. Then it's still Cauldron, then it's still Dry River but you would keep one of your own home maps for a future time. They could opt to go for Dry River as well, but I feel like if they do that, even if they win, they will have to play against their opponents on two opposing home maps for the remaining two games. That feels a little problematic to me. Yeah, no, that could definitely be problematic. And I like your idea about mountain clearing and one of the reasons why especially for well, actually both of these teams but for bc and fiage if they want to pick it they still have some of the best civilizations that mountain clearing has when it comes to civ picks right they've only used english once they've only used hre once so they have the ability to do that again puppy pond lash also have that ability with english being played by puppy pond lash in game three and HRE being in game two. So they do have that potential, and that can gear up to be a real powerhouse of combinations with English and HRE. Now, on Mountain Clearing, besides those two sieves, what kind of sieves, if you're looking to play something different and you're looking to be a little spicy, what sieve are you going to dip your toe into? I, I think HRE has to be a lock on both sides. Mm -hmm. And I have a feeling that it's going to be English, but I'm wrong. It's going to be double Mongols. So here's the idea. First of all, I guess I was right about the assumption that they will take Mountain Clearing. <laughs> but the bigger thing here is that we have seen how Beastie and Fiege love to play into the early boar play. We have seen some other teams do that, but I do not recall Puppy and Lash going for it. Now... When you play into the early board with the HRE, you want to have a teammate that's capable of setting you up for that. That is oftentimes an English player with the man-at-arms or even the villagers with the bows. But Mongols can accomplish the same as well, either with spears or even horsemen possibly. So I expect to see a lot of combat going on for that middle part of the map and just trying to deny each other's access to that boar in the middle. Yeah, and I mean, we talked about, even yesterday, for some of the games that we had on Mountain Clearing where HRE was involved, that boar is a really, really good resource of food. Obviously, the prelate's going to help you. It's going to give you that little bit of increase in gathering speed. But when you do have that prelate out there, and obviously it's advantageous, you've got to be thinking about also, instead of playing checkers, let's play chess for a second here. With that prelate all the way out there on the board, kind of inspiring those villagers, it means it's not back home. And when it means it's not back home is not only can the Mongols do maybe some raidability without a prelate being able to heal, but it also means if you get that Aachen Chapel up, 
you either have to make a second prelate to go in there or that prelate's got to walk all the way back to get his megaphone and get in that chapel. Now, of course, needless to say, this is a map where Beastie is going to be the one playing the HRE. It's his favorite civilization. And this is probably the map that he... I don't know if this is the map where he enjoys playing it the most, but it's definitely one of those maps where his HRE playstyle and how good he is with this civilization shows the best. The way that he uses emergency repairs, the map control elements, the way that he uses fast imperial, either for just booming up when the game is in a passive state, or possibly to get to imperial, get the bombards out to contest the middle. All these factors just make him a very good player on this map, especially with this civilization. Now, I haven't really seen a lot of Puppy and Lash games on this map, but this is a mirror matchup. I think it's the first mirror that we are having today, right? Um, no, actually, well, game number two, I believe, was Roos and HRE combined, right? True. Was that the mirror? True. I got okay. goldfish memory. It is true, indeed. <laughs> but they lost that mirror, so mm -hmm. history speaks against them. It's going to be interesting to see how the teams approach this game, though, because oftentimes we see teams going for this all-out-ish or all-in-ish approach towards the middle. Compared to 1v1s, you do have two sacred sites here, but they're close to each other. And oftentimes it works well when you just kind of have one player going to that strong position in Imperial, get some keeps up in the middle, and then play into Culverines, and the other player just assisting and facilitating the teammate to do it. Those strategies seem to have prevailed in previous rounds compared to strategies where both players are trying to contribute equally. Yeah, definitely. You're kind of... you're you're indirectly not necessarily by resources but you're slinging the hre player that you're playing that you're playing with right and we have seen in mountain clearing whether it be the semifinals quarterfinals other stages of this tournament where there have been some insane palace of swabia times <laughs> when you're actually getting to imperial if you have your teammate as a civilization they're okay to hang out in feudal you know, they're not going to do things like a fast castle. They're going to try to establish some kind of military presence around. Just keep everybody off your back. And we have seen some Palace of Swabia times almost, you know, below 12 minutes to try to get a Swabia. And I think that's that golden ticket. Just like you said, that's the golden ticket for mountain clearing. Because I don't know about you, when you've seen a lot of mountain clearing games, or even if you've played on any, it feels like this map just plays like King of the Hill. In a way, it does. I feel like it's even more all in ish than King of the Hill. It's a little bit mm -hmm. more difficult to play into the walls. You really need those keeps in the middle. But once you have it up, it can be a realistic goal for you to take the sacred sites and try to win through the sacred site victory condition. So you can definitely have these all in style approaches. And I think at least one of these two teams will attempt to do that. Obviously, one of the big differences between the two teams will be how the Mongol players can possibly slow down the opposing team's HRE player. The same way that we have seen in the previous two games, how the supporting player has to slow down the opposing French player to give an advantage to his own French player. I expect to see a similar mindset over here in this game. How can the Mongol players support their own HRE by slowing down the opposing HRE? Yeah, that's the best way to do it, right? Because then the Mongolian on the other side has to protect their own HRE instead of going against the HRE that they're supposed to be raiding against, too. So we're talking about how it's very HRE-centric, but it could be just because the Mongolians are the enzyme that really catalyzes the reaction. Maybe it's the Mongolians that are the most important. And we're going to see how important they are as Game 5 is going to be coming up. We're initiating the overlay Match point for Puppy and Puppy Paw and Lash on Mountain Clearing. Let's go. We will be jumping into game number four here in a matter of moments. It is match point for Puppy and Lash. Most of the sets that they have played in this tournament, they have been awfully close. They could have been eliminated at the quarterfinals level, but when it mattered the most, they brought their best. Now it is match point for them. It is just one win until they get to that long-awaited trophy here in Africa Duos. It looks like we're still a couple of seconds away. Um, folks, as a bit of a reminder, 
we will have no spec UI for this game either, just to make sure that we have no crashes. So that's not something that you should be surprised about. But here we go. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Match Point here in the Grand Finals of the Africa Duos. It is Beastie and VH in the cold colors with the HRE and Mongols. They will be facing off the team of Puppypaw and Lash with the warm colors, who also have HRE and Mongols brought in here. The map is mountain clearing, and to prevent any possible crashes as a safety precaution, we will have no spec UI for this game, so we do apologize for that. But, you know, it's more important to see what's going on on the screen and not have any crashes than having those little power bars, as nice as they look. <laughs> I uh, I definitely agree with you. The best game is the one that is actually played. And speaking of games being played, when you're talking about Mongolians and Dark Aids, let's take a look at the spawns that we're seeing here. I mean, this is Fiege's Mongolian spawn, which is fantastic. Puppy Paws Mongolian spawn. He's got the Uva right next to him, but it has to go a little bit farther for the gold. And as we all know, for the Mongolians, when we're talking about spawns, they're probably susceptible to the most when it comes to RNG of where spawns are actually developing. VH getting a little feisty in this game five, gonna be adding the barracks about a minute and 20 seconds in. And you gotta be thinking, Lidicor, just because of the distance between these civilizations, you gotta, you gotta get aggressive with it. You have to. Um, we talked about this in the pregame. In this map, a lot comes down to how the Mongol player can slow down the opposing team's HRE player how the Mongol player's early aggression is setting up the teammate for mid to late game success. Yeah, and with that little bit of aggression from those spearmen, maybe we can see some success translate over just a little bit. And obviously those spearmen from the Mongolians going to be able to be produced two at a time, popping out now with these Mongolian players also puppy paw doing some good synergy with lash lash being the hre player he's very dependent on getting safe resources getting them close to that Aachen chapel and making sure he can continue to age up so he's using his con gonna be able to kite those deer over to that starting town center and get under that influence of the Aachen chapel when it gets completed we talked about the hre being such a staple in mountain clearing and this is one of the reasons why. Look how glorious that Aachen Chapel is. It's hitting all four resources there. It is. It's such a vital element of playing HRE on a closed map like this. The other element that you will see once we get to a later stage is how the HRE will use emergency repairs to hold critical points of the map. Obviously, that's not something that we have just now. But as this game goes deeper and deeper, we will have that as a feature. You see, we have two sacred sites in the middle. It is a very much a realistic win condition for either of these teams to play an all niche style approach, securing the sacred sites and then just playing very defensive. We have seen instances of that in the previous rounds. Fast Imperial, multiple keeps, cover in defense. It has worked before. It remains to be seen if either of these teams will consider that a realistic win condition for hit the grand finals here. Yeah, and especially on match point, you got to be thinking if you're Puppy Paw and Lash, you have a couple games to give up. Necessarily, they do want to win this game five, but they don't necessarily need that all in or nothing strategy. I think BC and VH might have more of an influence to do that, we're taking a look at landmarks from the Mongolians getting completed deer stones, actually, for Puppy Paw getting completed VH. What it looks like is doesn't necessarily have the gold yet in order to make that, but Aachen Chapel completed by Lash. You can see that influence. It's such a wonderful influence. Beastie with his, of course, hitting all four resources as well. And Beastie already has 500 food stockpiled. Getting to Castle Age first when you're the Holy Roman Empire is so huge. Especially when you get baited by the income per minute out there. That's, folks, the income per minute. Costers Rough. sometimes do get baited as well. <laughs> but it wouldn't be surprising just to see a race to Castellage from the HRE players. And, well, I guess you weren't very off, and this is a huge thing for Beastie. He's sitting at 700 per or 700 food banked compared to Lash sitting at 200. That is a crystal clean build by Beastie. He's known for playing very effectively with the HRE. And a faster Castle Age over here can quickly snowball 
you see the amount of relics that are available for the players, Beastie can quickly turn a Ragnar's Cathedral into a gigantic eco lead. Even just 30 seconds advantage into Castle Age can actually be a game changer here. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's 30 more seconds that you get relics in your Ragnar's. It's 30 more seconds if you had the anticipation to make things like a Castle Age economy. If the HRE chooses to do that, you can get that out a little bit quicker, which is quite interesting just based on the resource stockpile and vodka showing us that Lash has about 700 food now. Whereas if you take a look at the minimap, looking at Beastie's side, he's already put down his Castle Age landmark, and that does not look like the Regnitz Cathedral, Itacor. That looks like a Burgrave Palace. Now, that's an interesting call, but I'm not against it. The thing with the Burgrave Palace is that you need a very consistent supply of food to be able to maintain production. But especially when you beat your opponent to Castle Age like this, you don't need much. You just need a couple of men at arms out, and that can already set you up for success. Spearman will trade against each other over here, but Fiege is the one securing ground and response from Lash will be his own Burgrave Palace. Neither of the HRA players is going for the Ragnitz Cathedral, despite the fact that throughout this tournament, the Ragnitz Cathedral has been the dominant landmark of choice for the HRA players on this map. Yeah, especially for how quick you can get up that castle time and how quick you can get that Ragnitz up, but we will be having a double cheeseburger on this one, two burger palaces gonna be coming up. Spearman trying to create some sort of aggressiveness by the Mongols of either side. It looks like uh, the Spearman from Puppy Paw is gonna end up going down and Puppy Paw actually having to try to help Lash a little bit more adding archers in as well. Now Beastie gonna be the first one to cast late at six minutes, 54 seconds, getting those men at arms very, very quickly. These are early men at arms and we'll be getting that castle upgrade very soon. But just because BC is the first one to do that as Lashes just gets completed, I feel like Lash is always going to be on the back foot. And it's always, all of these battles are always going to happen in his base, wouldn't you think? Yeah, that's the thing, right? Even just 30 seconds of an advantage into Castle Age means that you have a couple of men at arms out. And if the fights are happening inside your base, that will slow down your eco a little it will make it much more difficult to pump out army and it can snowball out of control. Big difference between the two teams is that Beastie already has the maces upgrade on the men in arms. You can see the little maces in their hands. And that is not something that Lash has right now. That mace upgrade does provide bonus damage against heavily armored targets like the men in arms. And that is a game changer. Now maces are in as well for Lash, but you see his gold mine is abandoned and as much, or as you kind of pointed out, once the fights are happening inside your base, you're in a troublesome spot. Right, and the thing that's happening as a result is Beastie's base is completely not raided. You know, it's, he's going to be able to get as much gold or as much food as possible. Lash has to change a lot of his macro around. You can see all of the villagers that are on the gold mine right now. Beastie is doing the best that he can in terms of maybe not necessarily getting villager kills, but at least doing some kind of villager disruption. One worker ends up going down on the western side of that gold mine, while on the other side, even though that's not a Regnitz Cathedral, that is a monastery that can house some relics. Beastie has the ability to send prelates out there pretty much by themselves to pick up relics, whereas Lash, he's just trying to break out of his front yard. Looking at the income per minute, it kind of tells you the story. Although Beastie has stalled out a little bit when it comes to food production, but now VH is pushing up the middle with the archers. They are securing that ground. It allows Beastie to start capping the sacred site, and you could even possibly start timer on it. But it looks like the men-at-arms have lost track of each other for a brief moment, and an opportunity for Lash might open up to harass Beastie here. Yeah, you could see the did add a decent brigade of men at arms. It looks like somewhere around seven to eight of them might find some villagers, but those villagers from Lash are also undefended. Both sides have undefended villagers. You could see how many villagers are going to end up going down for either side. It looks like one for Lash, second one ends up getting saved. A decent amount of them for Beastie end up going down, and that just shows. Look at how many men at arms he's got over there. This is probably around ten. He was able to get a surround on those villagers as well. So three or four end up getting down now. Beast or Lash with that 
Burgrave Palace is going to start setting his waypoint closer to that gold mine just to make sure he can get gold. But right now, Lidacore Beastie doesn't have a gold mine to pick from. Yeah, this is getting very close over here as the archers trade shots in the middle. For a moment, Lash got shut down from his gold. He even lost a villager or two. But now Beastie is the one who doesn't have access to at least mineable gold. But he does have the relics picked up, and this is a big difference between him and Lash. Lash is yet to pick up those relics. So even though Beastie doesn't have the option to mine the gold right now, that passive gold trickle is something that's coming in as a lifeline. Yeah, especially with men arms being the cost that they are, right? Only being uh, a little bit of gold, only about 20 gold you're able to on the relics that you have, you might be able to make them lash. Does take this fight against Beastie's men at arms town center trying to help him out. And I would say just because the Burgrave Palace was so close to Beastie, it would go by the way of Beastie. These Mongolian players, though, still sitting in Feudal Age. Archer's not going to be doing too much against men at arms, so they've been fighting mostly each other. Khan goes down for Fee Age. Try to hesitate putting your GGs in chat because this game is very far from over. Looks like Beastie just finally getting the grounds from under him. Burgrave Palace obviously helping him out, making a lot of those men at arms. It's going to make Lash and Puppy Paw start to back up even farther. This has been a battle for the middle over the past minute or two, and it looks like neither side really has that upper 100% advantage that can dictate the game. Yeah, Beastie does have a big edge over Lash, though. Relics are on there. In fact, he didn't just collect his own relics. He has taken the relics away from his teammates' base as well. You see, available food is starting to run low for both of the HRE players. Beastie even healing up his men-at-arms, though. He has been on the berries. Mongol players are both in Feudal Age, though. And I feel like one of the things that I'm missing here from either teams, actually, is teaming up on one player. Let's say you team up on Beastie, men at arms will trade against each other and the archers can focus whales. This has been missing from both of these teams. So far this was two separate 1v1s. We've yet to really see a lot of teamwork over here when it comes to the army control. You know, it's so funny you say that because as soon as that happens, it looks like you can see all four colors on the map right now. One good thing that the archers are doing for the Mongolians is to see a Wololo on the south side. Not going to pick up any men at arms, but the archers from Puppy Paw are actually quite plentiful. Fiege is going into a couple of Keshiks to try to create a front line. A counter Wololo by Lash trying to get maybe an archer or two, maybe a men at arms actually comes up short and creates a little bit of time for both of those players to retreat. One thing about Fee Age, getting those Keshiks means you have a raid over there on the south side. I'm not sure for food resources, they gotta be going outside, not much in the way of farm transition yet. That's one of the things that you sacrifice, Lidicor, for the Burgrave Palace. You don't have necessarily the wood to make farms and to go through that farm transition because you're so consumed with trying to make men at arms just to outmass your opponent. Yeah, uh, men at arms here missing an opportunity to jump on the lumberjacks. They have just attacked the Aachen Chapel, means that the villagers will be safe. As you said, Kashyyyk are slowly being added over here by Fiege. On the other side, Papipo remains with archers only. And for a brief moment, we could even see Lash stealing a relic from the other side of the map. This is a good fight in the middle of the field, though. Beasties men at arms are nowhere to be found, and the archers combined with the men at arms do repel the army of Fiege. Yeah, that was a pretty particular 2v1 in that situation. Beasties men at arms were sent back home and they continue to stay there. They haven't made a lot of headway in terms of movement outside of the base. And you can see Puppy Paw also and Lash's team with those prelates starting to get some of those sacred sites, starting to get some more passive income. And now this is the very, very important thing about King of the Hill. We're going to start that Sacred Sight timer. Don't know if it's necessarily going to be game ending, but putting your opponent on a timer seems like a good idea. And now Lash and Puppy Paw putting those armies, it looks like they were trying to initially put those armies together. You, I agree with you, Lidicor. Having some men at arms, even just splitting off a couple of them, I seem would be a good idea against these feudal aid archer army compositions out of the Mongolians. And it looks like we're going to be seeing that with Lash and Puppy Paw. We have those pink men at arms and those red archers from Puppy Paw. They're trying to stay together. They're trying to make sure that none of those army compositions end up getting lost so dastardly. 
They're doing a good job of splitting up the other team. They have been poking around the food eco as well, and you see why. They are trying to cut down the opponent when it comes to the food eco while also having a boar hunting operation in the middle. This is why they are standing and fighting. They need to hold this ground, and you see there are prelates on the back line helping out, healing, getting the blessing going on on the teammates as well. There is a defensive tower as well, but the men at arms, they're slowly disappearing over here from Lash. He needs some reinforcements over here. He does not want to lose this boar. No, absolutely not. And that boar is so good for food economy. That range mass from Puppy Pop pretty much untouched throughout the duration. A couple Keshks tried to get a flank over there on the eastern side. Surprisingly enough, these men at arms seem to be trading themselves away. Good use of heavy maces. Looks like five or six men at arms, four Lash, and only three for Beastie. But Beastie sending his men at arms elsewhere on the south side, trying to get a raid on Lash. Obviously, that food economy for how expensive those men at arms are are super, super important. And look how quickly those men at arms from Lash can take down Keshix. Just taking a couple foul swoops, they end up taking it down. Vodka showing us the income per minute. Not going to get fooled twice by that Litacore income per minute of Lash and Beastie. Lash has almost double, and that just means more men at arms. This is a tricky spot for Beastie to be in. He did the right thing by raiding the enemy eco, and he did some damage on Lash. But it is not something that compensates for the fact that his opponent is on a boar and his villagers are being buffed. Whereas beasties are now on farming, archers are diving in there as well. A lot of damage potential to be had as the men at arms are also repelling Fiage. Looks like a defensive keep will come in for Beastie, but you really wonder if he wanted to place that keep elsewhere and he's just placing it there, now seeing the archers pushing his eco. Oh, this is this is such a crazy game to look at. Now Heavy Mace is coming as well with the 200 weapons for Lash. Advantage when it comes to the quality of his men at arms now. And indeed, Beastie wants a different location for that keep. But it's getting dicey. It's it's a tricky spot, right? Beastie has a farming transition, so in the long run he's gonna be fine. But until that boar lasts for Lash, his position is so much better. Yeah, you can see how good that boar is for him. Look at the men at arm count over here on the south side. Burgrave Palace doesn't seem to be losing a second in terms of men at arms production. They're able to even get some defensive structures. You can see some outposts over here in the middle going to be made by Puppy Pop. Most likely going to be able to get some good emplacements on those as well, assuming whenever Puppy Paw and VH want to go up to Castle Age, those outposts might be able to get some spring old emplacements. But for now, they're just going to be shooting arrows. The men at arms, look at what they're deciding to do. They can just run through it with all of these men at arms. They have so many arrows coming out of the caster tower, from the <laughs> towers, excuse me. And uh, it just, those men at arms, they're just not going to die. Oh, it's the momentum-based game. You see the income per minute being so heavily in the favor of Lash. Puppy's support here with the archers is also great, but a lot comes down to the fact that Lash does have access to that boar with the HRE. He didn't take it in Dark Age. He's taking it in Castle. They do have both sacred sites now. Beastie is doing a good job with these raids, but now the focus has to shift elsewhere. Focus has to start shifting towards the middle. We have a lot of towers coming in there. Fiege is making a transition that's very heavy on the cavalry side. You see he's got like four stables going. But Lash has got an almost invincible force of men at arms now. Those men at arms are better than what Beastie has right now. And that's a lot of archers supporting that too. Yeah, I mean, the archers are certainly going to help from Puppy Pot just from having as many as he has the Mongolian side has been pretty much idled. There's so many villagers inside that town center to the point where Beastie knows his teammate cannot handle this. Beastie and Fiage surrender on this game five. Puppy Pot and Lash are your Africa duos champions taking down Beastie and Fiage in a four to one series. What a series did we just witness. Beastie and Fiage took game number one, but then it's four in a row, and all of these games from Puppy and Lash were under 26 minutes. Only a single game out of the four games that they have won was longer than 20 minutes. This one, just under 20 minutes over here. Once again, aggression pays off. 
and the practice pays off. Papipo and Lash, you could see that on the streams of Lash, they have been grinding this game, grinding these 2v2s ever since they knew or got to know that they will be playing together. Beastie and VH did the same thing, but in this grand finals, it is Papipo and Lash who secure a 4-1 to victory, and they will be the champions of Africa duos. Yeah, and I'm seeing all the wonderful GGs in chat and some other people in chat saying... You know, Lash and Puppy Paw weren't the ones that they thought were going to win this tournament. Well, how the turns have tabled, my friends, in a 4-1 to series, Puppy Paw and Lash getting that W. It goes to show that practice does pay off. So if there's anything, a little piece of life advice as you are watching the finale of this tournament, if there's anything that you guys want to do, just practice hard enough and you might just get there. Indeed, Beastie and VH had a crazy run in this tournament as well. Included some spectacular series. Puppy Paw and Lash will come out victorious. You look back at this series and you look at tiny differences. Very tiny differences. Especially beyond game number two. Baltic. It's a map where the bounty being favorable for Puppy Paw and how they use those initial militias to harass VH just snowballed into a win. You look at Dry Arabia. Two men in arms slowing down the French player to a point where it just snowballed out of control. Rocky Canyon, longer, grindy game. Puppy Paw and Lash kind of learning from how Marine Lord and Aliona fell to Beastie and Fiege with the same matchup. And the mountain clearing again, it's a tiny differences that make the mile. How Puppy Paw and Lash were able to secure the middle, secure the boar, and just chip away with villager damage here and there slowly grinding down Beastie and Fiege. What a spectacular series we have seen over here. And it is Puppy Paul and Lash who secure the tournament. It's going to be very fun to listen to their thoughts about their victory here. Yeah, and I think now we are going to be setting up an interview. Am I correct? We're going to be hearing from the winners themselves. Indeed, we are going to have a quick interview here with the champions, ladies and gents. Puppy Paw and Lash, your champions here in Africa Duos. Hello, hello. Hello. <laughs> Congratulations, folks. I guess practice pays off. That's probably a great point to start with. When you open Twitch the last two weeks, every single time you see Lash streaming his 2v2s with Puppy Paw, how important do you think that prep was in becoming the champion? Um, well, it's important, yeah. I mean, we, we were getting better throughout the uh, last two weeks, so... Yeah, I think it was really important because, um, yeah, we started... Uh, we never played before together, and, um, yeah, I think we struggled a bit in the beginning, but... Yeah, we, we we are getting better and better. Um, yeah, and I I really enjoyed the training sessions and um, yeah, so it was it was awesome to prepare for this for this tournament. It was really fun. Yeah, these you two managed... have been have yeah, been a ahead, lot of fun. <laughs> no, no, I, I that's all. I... Yeah. So you you mentioned you haven't really played together before. What was the biggest weakness that you managed to overcome through these training sessions? What was the biggest change that has happened to your play style compared to day number one of practicing together and, of course, the grand finals? Okay, our, our biggest struggle for sure was and is Hill and Dale. <laughs> we just suck on Hill and Dale, but <laughs> uh, I, I think this is fine. Um, I, I think we we learned or we felt confident with me going more for Kev and Puppy more going for, for the Archer ball. And overall we I think we, we start trying that I'm I'm the punching ball. I, I try to to get time for Puppy to, to raid and get him for example, with Abbasid and Ruse, I'm always trying to, to, to get the time for Puppy to go to um, Castle Age. And um, yeah, stuff like this, um, we, we found out, I guess. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, like, I think me and Rash are both pretty aggressive, and 
that's fine if you can end the game, but sometimes like if we couldn't end the game, we would just kind of fall flat on our face because we would both be so all in. So sometimes I just learn to like kind of play a bit more uh, for my economy and stuff like that. Well, first of all, Puppy Pond Lash, I want to say congratulations. And I'm very glad that you guys ended up winning this tournament and taking a 4 1. I do have a couple questions for you, though. You guys talked about aggressiveness a little bit and how important aggressiveness is and how important closing the game out quickly could you do me a favor take me to through game three a little bit because that was the one on dry arabia where beastie and fiage went for french and molly and you guys went with more of an english puppy paw with the vanguard bedded arms did you have an idea that they were going to go something like french and malian and was that kind of your strategy if you saw that well I had an idea, yeah. I saw them playing in the last series. I mean, I, I didn't know for sure, but... Um, I, I mean, English French is just very solid on an open map like that, and because we could pick it twice in this draft, I thought, let's just open up with this. And um, Yeah, and... Like, opening Men in Arms is very strong in that matchup, just because we know that they're gonna, probably going to go pro scouts, and we can just delay French goal and stuff like that, so... Yeah, we, we tried out Malian's French also. And uh, we were pretty sure that they wanted to go for pro scouts and feeding the French. And yeah, we we just tried to to interrupt that. That and yeah, I I agree. I think French English is like you, you can't do something wrong with this uh, with this Swift pick. English French is just solid. Yeah, it certainly is solid. And then after that game three. When you guys went into game four with Rocky Canyon, you guys went with Ottoman in French. And I know, obviously, we had some technical difficulties in there, but did you feel like with the Ottomans, you were able to put the same amount of pressure like the English in game three? Was it kind of just a do-over of the same strat? Well, for me... Sorry. Uh... Uh, you can answer. <laughs> okay. Uh, I mean, it, I, I attempted to, yeah. I mean, the third game, they had a super bad spawn, right? Like... The French had so much trouble getting the gold, so we could end the game very quick in that one. Especially because English is a bit quicker, but... Um, yeah, my idea was essentially the same, just to kind of put some pressure on the French player, so I'm down a bit, but... Um, I kind of realized in that game I couldn't end the game, so I had to kind of go into Siege and defend a bit more, and fight from there. Yeah, and we thought about going for English-French again, but um, yeah, then we were thinking about it, and we wanted to keep English maybe for another map. So we were thinking, okay, Ottoman's French is really good as well. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, I honestly, I appreciate the input Littercore gave kind of the forest where I wanted to ask questions about the trees specifically. But for both of you guys, and I know for uh, both of you guys specifically, I believe this is probably your first S tier tournament victory for people like Puppy Paw, who we see stream a lot, and for people like Lash, who stream and play tournaments consistently. Lash, I've seen you play in War Chief Club. I've casted you in War Chief Club, like, oh my god, probably like a year ago. And <laughs> seeing in the positions that you guys are now taking down an S-tier tournament title, the heartiest of congratulations to you guys, and it has been a pure joy watching you guys play this game. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I just want to say um, I'm really, really happy that I could play with Puppy Paw because um, it was just awesome. Puppy Paw was just a chill dude. I, I, I feel like I'm <laughs> uh, even when, when we won, I was like I wanted to scream around and I was so fucking happy. <laughs> and uh, dude, Puppy Paw is just ice cold every time, oh. and he made so so good. <laughs> so he made so good calls in the in the games, and um, yeah, it was just. Uh, yeah, Puppy Paw was just uh, the best teammate I could imagine. It was really cool. So thank you, Puppy. Thank you. I, I'm I'm happy I could have picked you because I, I honestly I I think you were by far the the best pro left. <laughs> yeah, I'm just happy. Thank you. All right, folks. and um, of hey, course, go ahead, go ahead, TV. Thank you for the tournament. Uh, I said it earlier. I I think uh, it made. A lot of fun, and um, we had so even teams uh, with this concept. 
I think that was awesome to watch and uh, to play. Um, that was really, yeah, a, f a fresh tournament. And I feel I watched it myself, and I I enjoyed watching it. And I feel like, um, yeah, it was it was a cool, a really cool experience. So uh, thank you for organizing. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, guys, for playing in it. And congratulations again for becoming the champions of Africa Duos. It was a lovely sight to see you guys succeed off the back of all that practice. Congratulations again. You will take the rest of the day off. You will enjoy yourself as we will wrap up the show. Thank you so much again, folks. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And with that, we are coming to a close here at EGC TV. Africa Duos, we had four days of crazy 2v2 action. A lot of very close sets, but it's time for us to say goodbye. EGC TV is not done hosting events for the rest of the year, by no means. But we will have a summer break coming up at EGC TV. But you do want to stay tuned for news because there might be some juicy things coming your way. Make sure you follow EGC TV on the socials. Make sure you join the EGC TV Discord so you do get notified when tournaments like this will be announced. This was far from being the last tournament of the year, so you definitely want to stay tuned because more is coming. Oh, absolutely. If we can give me just a couple final words, I want to say thank you to Litacor. And thanks for EGC for letting me come on here and talk to you guys for this weekend. This was my first time on the A stream, and I hope that you guys appreciated the casting that we gave over the weekend as much as I enjoyed casting it for you guys. So seriously, thank you guys very much. I appreciate it. And with that, we are wrapping things up over here. Again, huge shout out goes to the behind the scenes crew, Vodka, our lovely observer for the entire event, Lord Pedido, tireless work on the admin department. Thank you so much again, Africa TV, for sponsoring this event. Hopefully, this will result in future collaborations as well. We'll have to see about that one. But it was, it is time for us to finish this off. Thank you so much, everybody, for tuning into today's show as well as tuning into the previous days. Hopefully, you've enjoyed the show. If you missed out any part of it, make sure you check out the EGC TV YouTube channel for the WADs. And again, make sure you follow EGC TV on all the socials. Join our Discord. Because if you want to hear about more tournaments coming up, that's the place to be. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us today. And see you in the next esports event of Age of Empires 4 by EGC TV.